Good afternoon, everyone. Let me welcome all of you uh, to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting. This is our first meeting of 2024, so let me just say Happy New Year to all of you who have joined us both in the audience and those who are joining online or through Orange TV. As we begin this afternoon, I want to take a personal privilege of making some acknowledgments. I, I see one of my sons in the audience there, Antoine, uh, is one of my twin sons here. He's a, a businessman here in the area and, and does some volunteer work with our MLK initiative. Uh, so you'll hear more uh, from them in just a few moments. But as we begin, I want to call on Commissioner Michael Scott to introduce his guests who will be bringing the invocation for this afternoon. Uh, following the invocation, Commissioner Scott, we ask that you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And following the pledge, Communications Division Manager Dr. Jeffrey Williamson will read proclamations recognizing a National Poverty Awareness Month and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day here within Orange County. And with that, Commissioner Scott, you're recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor, and thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Happy New Year. Uh, my guest today is uh, Rabbi Yehida Shapensky. He's the dean and head of school for the Orlando Tour Academy located in District 6. Rabbi Shapensky is the dean and head of school at the Orlando Tour Academy. It's the largest Jewish day school serving Orange County and Greater Orlando. Uh, Rabbi Shapensky grew up in Queens, New York, and after studying post-high school for his rabbinic ordination for 10 years, he received his rabbinic ordination from the rabbinical, school of, rabbinical Seminary School of America. Rabbi Shapensky moved his wife and three children to Orlando in July 2010 to open the Torah Academy. And that school opened with just 12 students in the 2010-2011 school year. And now, 14 years later, they have 195 students in a pretty decent waiting list. So from preschool to eighth, uh, Rabbi Shapensky provides rabbinic vision and guidance for the Orlando Torah Academy and is currently focused on the next phase of growth for that school uh, and its students and families. As a resident of Orlando and Orange County, uh, for the past 13 years, Rabbi Shapinsky loves taking advantage of the family and friendly wholesome environment that Orange County provides. Uh, of course, the beautiful weather, with the exception of today, <laughs> and more importantly, the activities and entertainment that him, his wife, and his children are able to enjoy. Uh, he leads a great school. Uh, he's a great partner. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Rabbi Shapinsky. Commissioner Scott, thank you for inviting me here today. With the, with the permission of Mayor Demings and the Board of Commissioners, as we gather today, let us offer our praise to God. Let us recognize and appreciate his greatness and give thanks for his constant and consistent benevolence, which he bestows upon the world at large, every living being, and specifically us, the human race. Sovereign of the universe, from the beautiful, intricate world and all its fine detail, to the majesty of mankind, your creations reflect your might. They tell your glory and reveal your wisdom. We are forever thankful to you for your never-ending kindness, for every single breath, for your deliverance, for your salvation, for the miracles that you perform for us every single moment of every single day. Sovereign of the universe, as your most prized creation, the creation of which it says in the book of Genesis, God created him, mankind, in his image. We beseech you, grant us the strength and fortitude that we need to carry out our awesome responsibilities to each other and to all inhabitants of this world. Bless us with the clarity and understanding to fulfill our purpose and mission and protect us from the stumbling blocks that are placed before us. Master of the universe, in a world that seems to be in perpetual state of peril, where forces of evil do not cease to exist, Please protect and guard us from those who conspire to do evil to us. 
Undo their counsel and nullify their plans. Help us pursue peace and tranquility and remove the forces of evil who seek to sow discord and division amongst us. O gracious and compassionate one, let those who are in distress and captivity find relief. Release them from the darkness into light, from subjugation to redemption. Let those who need healing, whether it be physical, emotional, or spiritual in nature, be healed from their ailments speedily and fully. Master of the world, you have blessed the great state of Florida and Orange County with so many great and talented people. They are dedicated and committed. From first responders to medical personnel, from our elected officials to utility workers, from the paid professionals to the unpaid volunteers, everyone united together in the great band called Humanity. For all those involved in the needs of the community with integrity, may the Holy One, blessed is he, pay their reward and remove from them every affliction, heal their entire body and forgive their every iniquity and send blessing and success to all their handiwork. May he who makes peace and harmony in his upper realms make peace and harmony within each one of us. And may he make peace and harmony amongst all of us and the entire universe. Amen. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. We do have proclamations today. We have two. The first one is for United Against Poverty. And the proclamation reads, whereas for the past 20 years, United Against Poverty has worked to inspire and empower people living in poverty to attain economic self-sufficiency. And whereas United Against Poverty provides an array of services to struggling families, including crisis care, case management, workforce development, employment training, education, and long-term food assistance. And whereas United Against Poverty strongly believes a person's circumstances do not define them, and they are committed to empowering those in need to break the cycle of poverty. And whereas during 2022, United Against Poverty's partnership with Orange County helped to assist 9,263 families. And whereas United Against Poverty has helped more than 7,715 families gain access to low-cost groceries, saving families an aggregate amount of $4.39 million on their household budgets. And whereas throughout the year, United Against Poverty provided 8,137 different services, including housing, emergency food assistance, education, and crisis counseling. Now, therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim January 2024 as United Against Poverty Month in Orange County, Florida, and encourages all residents to work together to support those families in need. Done and ordered this ninth day of January 2024, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and delivering a few brief comments is Dan Pugh, who is the board chairman for United Against Poverty. Mr. Pugh. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> commissioners, it's indeed a privilege um, to stand before you today and say thank you for all the work that you've done to make us successful. 
Uh, the proclamation says a lot, but quite frankly, if we didn't have the partnership of the county and the city, we would not be able to accomplish all that, that we uh, propose to do and we're uh, obligated to do under our mission. So we want to thank you very much. We've had a good partnership with you over a number of years. You've recently helped us uh, accomplish a freezer project, which we've drastically needed. That's been recently finished, and we'll be having a grand opening on that later this month, which all of you are invited to. Also, we're looking to redevelop our Michigan Street property and incorporate at that time some low-income housing. So we will be looking to uh, your support once we move into that project as well. So thank you very much for all you've done and continue to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pugh and team and mayor. Our second and final proclamation today is for Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And the proclamation reads, Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man who brought hope and healing to America through courage, truth, justice, dignity, humility, and service. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. exemplified universal compassion and unconditional forgiveness and possessed nonviolent principles that empowered his revolutionary spirit. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned a different world for American people that extended beyond cultural and external differences. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted his life to activism and moral authority that resulted in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting, Acts rights, and the Voting rights Act of 1965. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the voice to the relentless spirit of millions who sought change and unity across the country. And whereas, doc, and whereas the Orange County Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. initiative continues to work towards Dr. King's six principles of nonviolence through year-round activities that promote cultural awareness and collaboration countywide. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. viewed nonviolence as a way of life for courageous people who sought to win friendship and understanding, vowed to defeat injustice, not people, chose love over hate, and believed that the universe was on the side of justice. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the catalyst for the unification and healing of America and its people as he earned the respect and admiration of men and women worldwide who continued to embrace the ideals he embodied during his life. Now, therefore, Jerry O. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim Monday, January 15th, 2024, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Orange County, Florida, and we recognize his lifelong commitment and efforts on behalf of all humanity. Done and order this ninth day of January, 2024. Receiving the proclamation and delivering a few brief comments is our friend, Dr. Earl Mowat. Dr. Mowat is the co-chair of the Orange County MLK Initiative. Dr. Mowat. Mayor, commissioners, I want to thank you on behalf of the initiative. It is an honor to serve on the uh, initiative. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Earl Moat, and I am one of the co-chairs for the Orange County Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Initiative. And I do want to acknowledge my co-chair on Shanto An, who has been so instrumental in profoundly helping in shaping the initiative, goals of the initiative. So I would like to acknowledge her presence here today. We are honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of Dr. King and his work. He was a true public servant to many and his legacy continues to live on through groups such as the MLK Initiative. To Mayor Demings and this entire commission, thank you. Thank you for your continued support for recognizing Dr. King and his service to humanity. We are proud of the work we have done in the past four years in the Orange County, in Orange County the representative that, that represents Dr. King's six principles of nonviolence.
Through our continued efforts, we have an exciting year ahead of us with lots of meaningful projects and events scheduled for the community. To note, we will be participating in collab collaboration with U.S. Hunger and the City of Orlando MLK Commission on Monday, January 15th for the MLK Day of Service Million Meal, Million Meal Packing event. It will be held at the Orange County Convention Center and we are encouraging, encouraging residents to come out and join us along with other community groups to volunteer in support of this very worthy cause. More, te more details on that can be found on the Orange County government website, www.ocfl.net. Again, the MLK Initiative also has its calendar of events scheduled throughout the, this upcoming year that will include our MLK Read Around the County book project, a tribute to Coretta Scott King, Hot Pot, Cuisine Fellowship with Fusion Fest, and our annual Juneteenth celebration, just to name a few events. Our 2024 calendar of events can also be found on the county's website, www.ocfl.net backslash MLK. And last, I would like to acknowledge all of our MLK initiative members that are with us today. Please stand to be recognized at this point because we could not do this without, your, without the team. So MLK initiative members, please stand. Thank you. And again, thanks to each of you and the commission for your continued support. All right, before we go to public comment, uh, today's weather is impacting our county operations and uh, we may have to make some adjustments uh, throughout the remainder of today. And as a result of that, I wanted to uh, give our Board of County Commissioners as well as those in our audience a bit of an update of, about what is happening at this point. So I'm gonna ask uh, the Deputy County Administrator and Director of Public Safety, uh, so Danny Banks to come forward and kind of just share with you some of the developments based upon um, the weather today. With that, Mr. Banks, you're recognized. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, Comptroller Diamond. Uh, as you mentioned, Mayor, we've got a pretty severe weather system headed our way. We've all been monitoring uh, throughout the day its impacts in North Florida and really the northeastern United States. You see in front of you the weather uh, radar it's current right now and you can see as it advances what we can expect in orange county we've already seen today in orange county winds of 20 to 30 mile an hour winds if you've been outside you've already experienced those uh, we can expect some pretty rapidly deteriorating conditions in orange county uh, beginning about 4 p.m this afternoon and lasting the worst of the conditions we expect to be between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. this evening. Orange County is already under a tornado watch and that currently is extended until 9 p.m. this evening. Uh, our forecast for those severe winds are still in the sustained area of around 20 to 30 miles per hour, but what has 
become more concerning is the anticipated gusts. And we are forecast to receive, in that worst period, gusts of 50 to 60 miles per hour in Orange County. Uh, possibility, certainly, with those that level of wind gusts that we'll see some damage, uh, trees down, power outages, possibility of tornadoes. There have already been some reports of some tornadoes in North Florida. Uh, certainly, uh, that's why we're experiencing the tornado watch right now and some uh, potential for hail in Orange County as well through the evening. So uh, with that in the, in the interest of public safety, uh, for both the public and our employees, we are uh, stopping all non-essential Orange County government services at 3 p.m. today. There are still many services that are considered essential, but all non-essential services will be stopped, allowing people to kind of get off the roads uh, and get home to the safety of their homes by 3 p.m. today. Uh, Orange County Public Schools, you may be aware, is maintaining their schedule till the end of their normal periods today. That will include the extended day schedules for those who have their children in extended days. But after that, all Orange County Public School services and activities after hours have been canceled for the remainder of the day. Our Office of Emergency Management is active right now, have been monitoring the weather right now uh, throughout the day and will continue through the, the evening. We're in um, communication with all of our department directors and through the evening those departments will be reporting back to our Office of Emergency Management any impacts we see, any wind damage, uh, road damage, any power outages. I'll expect uh, by late this evening we'll be able to provide you all with a report, a summary report of what exactly we've seen through the storm's impact uh, through the evening into the, late, uh, into the later hours of this afternoon. So I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have, Mayor. All right. Uh, do we have any questions at this time? Okay. So it is going to be important to us that um, uh, today we do have the business of the people that we have to take care of this afternoon because of uh, publicly noticed public hearings and other things. So we're going to have to work succinctly hopefully to get through as much of what we have planned on our agenda as we possibly can uh, to um, allow time for uh, those of you who may need to to leave as well but we wanted to give you that update sometimes with weather phenomenons we um, we thought that based upon uh, overnight and early this morning uh, what uh, our weather forecasters were saying was we would be minimally uh, impacted and we likely still will um, have minimal impacts as, as compared to some other areas but it looks like we will be more impacted than perhaps we projected and because of that we've had to make some adjustments throughout the day uh, director banks and our emergency operations center uh, they have kept me and the county administrator uh, well informed as the day has uh, moved forward. And because of that, we've had to make some adjustments. So uh, with that, we uh, appreciate it, Director Banks, and we're going to move forward on our agenda this afternoon. The next item on our agenda is a public comment. And um, this is a period of time in which we invite members of the public uh, to come forward regarding topics or interests of concern that are within this board's authority. Uh, there are certain matters uh, which are not appropriate for public discussion during this public comment period. Uh, these matters include pending procurement or land use issues or concerns. Uh, this afternoon we will be bringing several land use issues forward and there will be an opportunity for public comment as we move uh, forward on, with that agenda. Um, and now, uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Thelmuller, are there any members of the public who wish to be heard at this time? Yes, Mayor, we have five individuals registered for public comment this afternoon. I'll call your names. Uh, when I do, please uh, approach the podium, give your name and record, or name and address for the record. First name is going to be Brooke Sasana. Brooke? Moving on. Bobby Beagles. And as you come forward, just please note that you'll have a couple of minutes by which to uh, plead your case. And uh, we just ask I that you uh, honor that, that, that time period. With that, uh, 
Mr. Beagles. Bobby Beagles, 21302, Fort Christmas Road, Christmas, Florida. Mr. Newton, I didn't forget this time. I'm here today to ask for funding from the tourism tax base to go to parks. Seven years ago, I wrote a draft and got the money from tourism tax for Orange County Parks for Christmas. We qualify underneath their jurisdiction Right there is an example of $132,000 of these magazines being mailed out to residents. Also, you will find that on the computer, they were somewhere around $20,000, and also there was $17,000. And there are the states, Michigan, Georgia, North Virginia, Alabama, that had viewed this magazine, which has Fort Christmas Park in it. That's the Christmas tree on the entrance to it. There is one of the houses those houses just got the new roof put on them. And here, that is a 1906 schoolhouse, which was All right, Mr. Beagles, I'm, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds. Uh, even though the which was restored buzzing. with tourism tax dollars. And I see I've run out of time, but uh, let me say the, <clears throat> Fort Christmas Park is on five national registers from foreign countries. My wife ran that park for 16 years. His four is the office and keeping up with everything. We have thousands of people a year comes into that park because it's free. So I hope y'all will look at that tourism tax money and put some of it back in the budget where parks then can look at different of some of y'all's problems where y'all need and they won't have to use the budget money that can use tax his and tour dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beagles. Uh, we'll move forward then to the next speaker. I've got a copy for you. Our next speaker is going to be Chris Peterson. There's a whole program. Hello, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Chris Peterson for Fortify Financial. Fortify is a PACE provider here in Florida, and I'm here to address an ongoing issue between the FPFA, the Florida PACE Funding Agency, in Orange County, as well as several other counties and tax collectors around the state. As you may know, back in late 2022, the FPFA completed a judicial bond validation, which included a preemption clause, uh, allowing them to operate statewide. Uh, my company, Fortify, is a PACE provider under the FPFA. However, we have absolutely no influence over them, and uh, the, or the actions of FPFA, and frankly, we're upset just as well as lots of other folks are. Um, but at the time the FPFA got the judicial bond validation, Fortify provided that to our outside counsel, and based on years of extensive case law, uh, they, they opined that it was valid, and we began in good faith on the reliance of the court's validation order. Thankfully, Orange County did put the assessments on the tax roll. However, there's no assurance that they will continue to be on the subsequent tax rolls due to the lack of an ILA, which is a county provision. And we, Respect home rule, we're, we're, we're going to support the legislation. Again, we had, no, we had nothing to do with this, but the result of this is there are projects that are in progress or that are completed that are not going to be put on the tax roll, um, and we can't fund them because we don't have the assurance of their continued 
uh, at subsequent tax rolls. And so what I'm, what I'm here to do is try to take care of those folks. There's, there's, there's constituents of yours that are, that are left with projects that are not completed, um, and there are contractors that have put money out that aren't getting paid. And so there is a solution for this. It's a, in the form of a curative ILA. It's a temporary ILA that could encompass these affected homeowners and contractors and ensure them they're able to repay their assessments as they, as they agreed to, and, and the contractors can get paid. I will send around a draft copy of this uh, for you all to, to take a look at. Um, and again, this is, we, we, we really didn't want this. We had nothing to do with this. Um, this is the result of their actions. Um, and again, happy to discuss this further offline. I can send everybody an email with this paperwork and hopefully we can start a dialogue about how to take care of these folks. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Peterson. No. I will um, ask the, um, we are in some litigation and I'll ask the county attorney uh, to kind of sh share some additional with uh, the status of the litigation. Yes, sir. Uh, I understand. Thank you. We have intervened in that as well. I'm sure as you probably know, because again, we have major issues with this. So okay. thank you. Thank, All you right. thank you for your comments. And well, I'd like to not share anything at this moment, Mayor, but um, uh, if he will send that information uh, to the attention of the county attorney's office, we'll be more than willing to have a sit down conversation with you about it. But uh, as he mentioned, the board is in litigation uh, with a uh, PACE provider, and so it would not be appropriate for me to have any discussion, nor the board members have any discussion at this point, point in time. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Olin Gaines. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Olin Gaines. I'm a young, up and coming minority developer in Apopka. Um, my journey started with the Mayor Jimmy, Mayor Jerry Demons office, the Honorable Mayor Jerry Demons office, with the help of uh, Christine Moore. They all were very helpful to me to buy two lots adjacent to mine. I'm the only one. Um, they gave me like a commitment letter from real estate management, and they stated that um, they would put my items on the agenda to be voted on by council. They all know about it put my items on agenda so I, could, so I can complete my development. On April 26th, the board council was supposed to meet and approve my items put on the agenda by real estate management. Um, I was told this was April 26th in meeting. April 27th, real estate management sent me a letter. The Honorable Mayor Jerry Demon's office tell me they changed their mind, and they're going to give it to, I call it a false adjacent owner. They know that. I'm the only adjacent owner. They sold the two properties to the other guy. That's not fair. I've been fighting for two years. I'm embarrassed to come down here. Been dealing with Honorable Mayor Jerry Demon's office, Christine Moore. No help. I sent letters, my concerns to County uh, Attorney's Office. I forgot to get attorney name. It's very nice. Um, um, and no help. And it's been over two years. I'm still fighting. I'm going to fight. They're doing development over there like crazy. I was denied by the housing department. The housing department. Any type of money to build a five-bedroom house and a two-bedroom house for minority Homeless people. I made the application two times. No help. They denied me. Talk to me like I'm nothing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Unfortunately. And I want some help. I want some help. And I need to know because I have a letter here from your right. attorney's office. And right, the letter is not honest. The letter is not truthful. Mr. I need Gaines, some help, you're, unfortunately, you're out of time. But we will have uh, staff follow up with you. Um, and Byron, uh, we have anybody in from real estate to, today that can uh, oh, get his okay. contact information? Okay. Pa pa pardon me? I can't hear you. I'll get you a phone. Just come around. Uh, you going to help me, um, Mr. Mayor? Because I'm tired. It's been three years. I'm stressed I, out. I, I hear and you. That's totally wrong. Don't do that. That's wrong. I hear you. Thank you very much. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much. All right. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Mayor, we have one speaker left uh, this afternoon, Delilah Smalley. When you get to the podium, please uh, name and address for the record. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Delilah afternoon. Smalley, and my address is 3613 Surrey Drive. In Orange County, when something goes against current standard, we bring it up to code. When I bought my house in February of 2012 with my father, who was a Vietnam veteran, it was a short sale and had a shed-like structure attached to my property that looked about as bootleg as a chain-link fence going across roads that were designed to be open. In 2014, I received a code violation saying I built it, so I brought a copy of my survey that proved I didn't. The county told me that I had two choices. I could apply for a variance because of the slight encroachment on the side yard setbacks, or I could remove it. In order to get the variance, I would have to apply, um, hire an architect, an engineer, pay about $1,600, so I removed it myself. I didn't create the problem, but it was my duty to solve it. Gabby's Law in Florida requires all direct paths to schools to have sidewalks, so all roads in Agnes Heights should have sidewalks. After a study was done by the county, they concluded that we, have, we could have sidewalks on all streets in Agnes Heights with relative ease, and we would still have plenty of room for a front yard. Regarding the fences, not only does a solid barrier on two roads inhibit our ability to walk dogs around the block, etc., and violate current um, open community policy, the gate itself and the 8-inch drop where Watauga connects to East Cayley is not ADA compliant. Our roads being over 150 feet and closed off with fences and no room to turn around is also an NFPA fire code violation. The exact two numbers of the two violations on our road are listed on my petition at change.org slash save walkways. If there is a fire on my street, the closest hydrant is on Watauga, which means a fireman would have to jump the fence and hope the 1,200-foot hose would reach. I'm here today to ask if what you ask of us. Bring it up to code or remove the fences. Please give us sidewalks. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Smalley. Uh, we're going to move to the next speaker, if there are any. There are no more speakers, Mayor. All right. Uh, then those of you who appear for public comment, thank you for your appearance today. We're going to move forward now to the consent agenda. I want to ask the uh, county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks, to present the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor Demings. I have two items to pull from the consent agenda. The first is item C3 under the county administrator. It's uh, an adjustment for the county administrator. That item is being pulled uh, at the request of Commissioner Uribe for discussion uh, following uh, the action on the consent agenda. And then the second item is I-6. That's I-6 under Planning Environmental and Development Services. It's regarding a non-substantial deviation associated with South Chase development. This item is being pulled to be considered concurrently with the matter that is the subject of public hearing E6 later this afternoon. And with that, Mayor Staff presents the remainder of the consent agenda for board action. All right, with the exception of uh, items uh, three and five, uh, is there a motion for approval? So move more. All right, is there a second? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes. And I just it is confirm that was C3 and I6. What did I say? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> C3. All right, you got it. And, uh, okay, and so the motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, we'll uh, take up item C3 at this time. Commissioner Uribe, would you like to offer any comments? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor. So I pulled this item because when I looked at this on page 98, there wasn't any information provided. Um, some of the information that I had requested was, did our county administrator receive a salary increase with all other county positions on October 1st? Also, what was the reason for increasing an additional increase of another additional 4%? And um, being that we went through 
a deep discussion on even getting salaries current on current county commissioners, I would, you know, this is a one pager, and I would like to know um, what, what was determined to bring this forward, why was it determined to bring this at this time, and, and also if the salary increase was done on October 1 with all additional county employees, why was there just another reason to do another salary increase? And so that information wasn't really provided. And so I just wanted additional, just information on how this came about. Um, just, you know, procedurally, we talk about transparency and, and I don't know how this decision or how it was brought up besides, I know you have a wage increment here, but what, what effectively brought this? Because I know this increases were a topic that were scrutinized and discussed in thoroughness on our board and we had to be voted on. So knowing that the county administrative position falls under ours, I would like to gather more information if you would share. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that um, I'm surprised that you weren't briefed on this regarding that issue, but uh, it is my understanding that uh, really simply more by omission than anything else, the county administrator as one of our county employees had not received uh, an increase that the other county employees in, uh, received, including the commissioners. And so I think- I got a memo that says differently from Ms. Yvette Best that there was an increase. Uh, the memo that I sent you, Commissioner, indicated that he did not receive the 4% increase in May of 2023 when all other employees received the 4%, and nor did he receive the 3% at that time. And so the request was for the 4% to be effective after approval of this meeting um, in lieu of uh, having not received it last year. And the reason for the delay in receiving that increase was because at that time the county administrator requested to have his increase delayed until such time as union contracts had been negotiated. And at the time we were negotiating the FOP lieutenant's contract. After that was uh, approved and subsequently uh, negotiated, then the conversation began regarding his increase from last year. So the 5% increase is the one that was done in October? Correct, October of 2023. So everyone received that, but when every uh, non-bargaining employee received the 4% in May of last year, the county administrator did not receive that increase. Okay. All right. You know, and, um, I was not briefed on this. This is information I've requested after the fact. So I had requested the information, so I was not briefed on this, so you know. So I had, I had requested this information. My aide sent it to you? She, I actually spoke to, I called to speak to you, and she advised that you were not available. I asked if she knew what questions you had. She advised me of the questions that you had, i.e., uh, did he receive the 5%? Did he receive that was, the 4%? That was, that's correct. I was right. not pre-briefed. That was, I initiated this request. I initiated the polling, and I wanted this to be discussed. So you're correct. I was not what the mayor had said was I briefed prior to, and I was not. I had initiated this information. Okay, I mean, I'm not contesting it. I wanted further information, and I just think that with us oh, trying okay. to have an open discussion, and, and I did pursue this information on my own. So so there's so. nothing here uh, to indicate anyone was not being transparent. I think in fairness to the county administrator, uh, this was uh, the appropriate action. This is the appropriate way to handle that uh, so that he was not being treated unfairly and differently than any other county employee. And so what I had been told was that uh, HR had contacted your office, just as Dr. Best has indicated, and provided the information. Uh, so uh, I just, but I can't discuss it with you, you know. And uh, I wanted that's that, correct. That's that's why I pulled it. That's why I had the email sent, and that's why those questions were asked. But I can't discuss it with you. Okay. Or share are you my are you satisfied at this yes, point? Yes, I with am the satisfied. Okay. But okay. I, I wanted right. to make it clear. So with I was that, do we have a motion for yes, approval? So I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Yes. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask um, uh, whoever can answer because I want a motion. Since he, you know, he didn't take the increase, and then in October 2023 we approved the increase, and he didn't get it either.
can we retroact to October so he could get that increase starting in October instead of today? Can we do that? I, I got the October. This, this, yeah. so the October is, is a you separate would, You would just be talking about the increase that was given in May. I believe it was May was the 4%. May, of, May 14th of 2023. Yeah, so whatever that pay period was when it commenced in May of 2023 would mm -hmm. be what you would go retroactive to. Okay. Um, but that, that would just be a calculation because you've got to do the 3% before you do the 5%. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that I'm aware of that would prohibit prohibit you from doing it retroactively. As you know, when you negotiate union contracts, mm -hmm. <laughs> typically they are done uh, retroactively in terms of their pay, but I'm not aware of anything that would prohibit you I from doing like that. I would like to motion, Mayor, for retroactive. Okay. You can make the motion. I, I, Question. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Okay, so for clarity, um, the county administrator did receive the fiscal or the annual fiscal raise that all county employees October 20th it's effective with this fiscal year, correct? correct? Um, he declined in the meeting the raise that we were given when you guys were doing like the market is to make us correct. competitive. Okay. Um, to me, it looks like, uh, and, and I'd like the county administrator to just kind of correct me if I'm wrong if I say this. So uh, from my experience, um, you take care of your people first. And then once your people are good, then you take care of yourself. And so uh, I'm assuming that was the logic as to why you declined, the, Byron, if you could chime in. I mean, yes, it's yes. only one group. The majority of your employees sure. take care of. So if you could just chime <laughs> sure. in real quick, please. I didn't tend to this to generate much attention. But yes, that military <laughs> adage as a, a military officer, the, and you're familiar with that, you take care of the troops first um, from a leadership position. That was the only thought. I didn't want to be a distraction. I didn't, I, so at that time, I knew there were some open matters that were still under consideration. So the thought was, let's just get every, all the things that were open at the time to get those taken care of, period. That was the only thought at the time. Uh, didn't, wasn't trying to draw any other attention. So Mayor, uh, I, I'm in uh, agreement with uh, Commissioner uh, Cordero. I, I would like to make an motion to approve the raise uh, with an amendment that it be retroactive to the date that all the other county employees receive their raise. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Moore, did you have something that you want to It's all been add? handled, thank you. Okay. All right, with that, we have a motion and a second for the retroactive. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right, the motion passes and it is unanimous. Mayor. All right. Mayor, is that your motion or Yes. No, it was my motion. I motion, he second. <laughs> well... However it is, it's fine, it passed. We well, attempted okay. to get Commissioner Gomez Cadero to make the motion, but she said she wanted to hear first from Commissioner Scott. Commissioner Scott actually made the motion, and Commissioner uh, Godero seconded the motion. So that's kind of the, the way that played itself out. All right. All right, so with that, um, the other item that was on the agenda will be taken up this afternoon as well. Uh, but I do want to uh, acknowledge several noteworthy items that uh, were just passed on the consent agenda. First, there were two contracts to purchase uh, 53.46 acres of environmentally sensitive land uh, in West and East Orange County. Uh, the preservation of the 33.96 acre parcel located in West Orange County will add to the existing Lake Lucy uh, conservation area and the property will provide water resource protection within the Wakaiva uh, River drainage basin as well as enhance an existing wildlife corridor. Uh, the preservation of the 19.5 acre parcel located in East Orange County will add to existing ecological uh, corridors of 9,000 plus acres, which includes the Hal Scott Preserve, the Pine Lily Preserve, the Long Branch and Hidden Pond Preserves, uh, the property will provide water resource protection, protection of a diverse range of ecosystems and enhances an existing wildlife corridor, as well as provide uh, nature-based recreational opportunities, which will provide the continuation of a route for the Florida National Scenic Trail uh, from Pine Lily uh, to Savage Christmas Creek Preserve. So, we have the blessing in this county of having a lot of uh, preservation lands, and we're adding to that. To date, Orange County has purchased and preserved 492.9 acres since the board approved the $100 million uh, 
allocation to purchase environmentally sensitive lands, and 28 uh, purchase contracts have been approved. Uh, for the first time, uh, also on this award's consent agenda, the Health Services Department was awarded a $1 million grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Health Resources and Services Administration to provide rapid rehousing services to youth and young adults 18 through 24 who are currently homeless in Orange County and may be living with HIV. The grant was submitted in collaboration with the Zebra uh, Youth uh, Coalition, a not-for-profit organization focused on delivering services to the LGBTQ plus youth population in Orange County. Uh, this is a three-year grant that offers case management services, housing location services, move-in and rental assistance, as well as coordination of medical and support services. Orange County is responsible for administering the grant, and the Zebra Youth Group is a sub-recipient responsible for providing uh, the case management and housing assistance services. Another item worth noting is, uh, uh, Mr. Beagles was in here, he may have left at this point, but um, the Bithlow Rural Area Water Phase 1 West Bid Award for $12.6 million to extend drinking water services to approximately 337 single-family homes in the Bithlow Rural Settlement Area south of State Road 50. Uh, Orange County Utilities will use funds from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act to give homeowners the opportunity to connect at no cost during the construction phase. The project completion is anticipated in fall of 2025. 2025. Uh, today's consent agenda also included several key initiatives aimed at enhancing the well-being of children, youth, and young adults in Orange County. First, there's a focus on behavioral therapy uh, for those aged uh, birth to 22 with behavior difficulties stemming from developmental, emotional, or behavioral disorders. Item D11 involved the approval of a contract with the Mental Health Association of Central Florida. Uh, this contract aims to provide mental health programming for youth encompassing prevention, screening, and early identification and interventions for children and young adults aged birth to 22. The contract is valued at $450,000 and will span a period of three years. Also, uh, D12 sanctioned a contract with Orlando Health Incorporated to deliver uh, comprehensive nutrition services to Orange County's youth and family uh, services. Um, Additionally, the programming will provide and prioritize mitigating the risk factors associated with infant and child mortality. The contract amount for this initiative is $1.5 million and covers three years. In addition, uh, we provided vocal, uh, vocational opportunities for persons with disabilities. Uh, $6.1 million investment over the next three years with, uh, for, that will support uh, children of incarcerated parents uh, with reemployability and early head start. Uh, we also uh, provided a professional services contract uh, for the owner control insurance program for the Orange County Convention Center Phase 5A expansion project uh, that was also previously approved. The contract uh, in question is for $1.2 million to implement and manage the ins insurance program for the expansion project. Uh, risk management has determined that the OCIP program will reduce overall project insurance costs. So we're being fiscally responsible in that regard. And finally, the board approved two agreements to waive impact fees and provide local government support and funding for Whispering Oaks, which is a new multifamily affordable housing development located off Hiawassee Road. The waiver of impact fees provides $2.5 million in savings, together with an additional $75,000 in Orange County local government support, uh, which provides a leverage uh, for the developer, uh, which can be used to secure additional funding. Whispering Oaks will add 192 units to the housing inventory 
with very affordable rents for a period of 50 years. Orange County, in other words, is continuing to create partnerships with developers such as the Southport development to tackle the affordable housing uh, needs in this community. I wanted to take time to kind of highlight some of these um, contracts today because I want our community to, to know that while we do seeing a, see a growing uh, challenge with homelessness within our community, uh, we are working diligently to address those issues and provide funding where we can. And with that, uh, we'll move forward to the next item on our agenda, which is discussion agenda. And I'm going to ask Ms. Karen Mathis, our procurement division manager, to come forward and frame this item. With that, Ms. Mathis, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. We have three procurement items today. Our first one begins on page 865 of your agenda. The Procurement Committee has evaluated proposals for Financial Empowerment Center Nonprofit Administrator. I am requesting board selection of one firm and an alternate. Commissioner Bonilla was assigned to the Procurement Committee. And Mayor, noting that Commissioner Bonilla is not with us right now. Oh, okay, I think somebody else might take the motion. Uh, Commissioner, I'll move for the selection of, um, sorry, move for the selection of Habitat for Humanity of Greater Orlando and Osceola County Incorporated 426.18 points with Hands of Central Florida Incorporated 360 points as the alternate. Second. Okay, and with that, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner gomez Cadero. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. Thank you. Our next item begins on page 868 of your agenda. The Procurement Committee has evaluated proposals for design services for fire station number 31 replacement. I am requesting board selection of one firm and an alternate. Commissioner Gomez Cordero was assigned to the Procurement Committee. All right. With that, Commissioner Gomez Cordero, would you uh, like to offer a motion? If there are no yes. other questions by members of the board. Yes. I move for the selection of KCF Design LLC DBA KMF Architects with 450 points, with Bentley Group Inc. 440 points as the alternate. Second, Scott. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. Thank you. Our final item today begins on page 874 of your agenda. The Procurement Committee has evaluated proposals for design services for Orange County Medical Examiner's office expansion. I am requesting board selection of one firm and an alternate. Commissioner Uribe was assigned to the Procurement Committee. Wonderful. All right. Uh, with that, uh, do we have a motion? I move for the selection of Grisham Smith, 320.75 points with Baker Barrios Architects, Inc., with 312.50 points as the alternate. Second, Scott. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. A motion passes, and it is uh, unanimous. Thank you. And as we move Mayor, to the next item on one the agenda. Item real yes. quick from the consent agenda that uh, I know you had asked about. Oh, there she is, an appointment, one of your appointments, the latest appointment of the deputy county attorney. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, we, uh, with uh, the action that we just took, uh, we also uh, have a new uh, deputy county attorney. Uh, she has been part of uh, our county attorney's office for a number of years. Georgiana, would you stand at this time so everyone knows you all have been working with her? So congratulations to you as well. And that's as a result of the retirement of Joel Prinzel, who retired in, in December and ha who has served the county for over 30-plus years. And so uh, we're elated to have Georgiana in that. A role. So thank you very much. Anything uh, to the county attorney? Anything additional? Nothing else to add, Mayor. Okay. Mayor, isn't that the, f she's the first woman to have that position? Uh, what was the question? Is she the she first, the first woman? First woman. Yes. All right. Well, history congratulations. Maker. A history maker there. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, so with that, we'll then move forward on our agenda. We're going to go to our uh, planning and zoning uh, adjustment recommendations. And Mr. Ted Kozak, 
uh, from our planning and zoning division is going to come forward and frame this item. And with that, Mr. Kozak, you're recognized. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, mayors and commissioners. On December 7, 2023, the Board of Zoning Adjustment heard 11 cases. Ten cases were recommended for approval. One case, ZM 2307044, Carly Newman, was withdrawn. The BZA appeal deadline was Tuesday, December 26, 2023, and no appeals were received. We request that the BCC accept the BZA recommended action and findings. All right. Uh, with that, if, are there any questions or any other items to be pulled? If not, is there a motion so for So moved, approval? Uribe. Second, Gomez. We have a motion by Commissioner Uribe, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to the next item. Mr. Jason Sorensen is going to come forward and uh, uh, at this time present uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendations. And you're recognized. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Commissioners. On December 21st, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered 11 conventional rezoning cases, one of which was postponed, one was recommended for denial, and nine were recommended for approval. We have not received any appeals. We have received one request from Commissioner Uribe to pull item RZ2312110, which is the address at 6025 South Orange Blossom Trail, and schedule the item for a public hearing. Therefore, the action requested is to approve the December 21st PZC recommendations with the exception of RZ2312110. Staff is available for any questions. All right. With the exception of the item that was pulled for a future board meeting, is there a motion for approval? So moved, you Second, Scott. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. Also, and I, I do uh, recognize that uh, the county attorney, uh, Jeff Newton, uh, very quickly uh, made the transition as <laughs> Ms. Georgiana uh, Holmes is, is now uh, is taking over the seat for this afternoon's uh, land use uh, issue. So he, he passed the gavel very quickly. So welcome. <laughs> All right, with that... Uh, We'll move to the next item on our agenda, item A1. Uh, this is a shoreline alteration in Dredge and Field. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Tim Hall to come forward as we open the public hearing on this item. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Today I'll be presenting a shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit request for KTM Property Holdings, LLC, care of Kyle Muelstein, and this is a, for a replacement seawall. One second, let me work out the clicker. <laughs> He's coming. Yeah, it's not it's not clicking at all. All right, here we go. Here's a location map. The property is located at 5620 Bayside Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32819, on the shoreline of a canal, which is located between Lake Blanche and Lake Chase. And you can see the parcel is outlined in yellow on this graphic. And then here's an aerial photo of the subject property. It's outlined in blue, and you can see the canal at the rear of the lot. Here's some photos of the existing conditions. You can see the existing seawall, which is that corrugated structure underneath the cantilevered boat dock on the canal. Uh, there was a permit issued for that boat dock and seawall uh, back in 1992, and they need to replace it at this time. Here is the site plan. The applicants are proposing to construct approximately 28 feet of replacement vinyl seawall along the canal at the normal high water elevation. The wall will only be installed around the base of the dock which is also being replaced under a separate permit that's under review. The proposed seawall will have a 10-foot return on both ends. There is an existing wall to the north and a partial seawall to the south and others along this canal. Because this is on the canal, riprap and plantings are not being required as to not create a navigational hazard. 
Here's a cross section of the replacement wall. And some considerations for you. This project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 33, Article 4, Section 33, 129D, and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. Notification of the public hearing was sent to property owners within 500 feet of the project site, and EPD has received no objections. Our finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 33, Article 4. EPD has evaluated the proposed SADF permit application and required documents and has made a finding that the request is consistent with Section 33, 129. And accordingly, the action requested is acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2308021 for KTM Property Holdings LLC, care of Kyle Muelstein, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. This is in District 1, and I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to make any comments? She's indicating no. Uh, so with that, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing portion and we'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, would you like to offer a motion? Uh, for the request action. Second, Gomez. All right, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner gomez Cadero. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to the next item, A2. Uh, Another shoreline alteration and dredge and fill item. We'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Hall, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, this one is a shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit number SADF 2306016 for the applicants Juan Jimenez and Yasmin Castillo for the construction of a concrete seawall and riprap. Here is a location map. The property is at 3108 Troy Drive in Orlando on the southeastern shoreline of Lake Pinelock. It's depicted in red on this exhibit. And here is an aerial photo with the subject property outlined in yellow. And this case has some enforcement history that I'll briefly step through for you as background. On May 11th, last, sorry, in 2022, EPD received a complaint about a possible unpermitted seawall at the property. On that same day, EPD staff documented that a seawall had been installed uh, and upon our file review discovered that the wall had not been properly authorized. We also observed a chain link fence extending below the normal high water elevation on the shoreline, which is prohibited. On June 2nd, same year, EPD initiated formal enforcement action with uh, incident number 22608275 and issued a notice of violation or NOV to the applicants. The NOV required that they remove the unauthorized seawall and fence. On May 15th of 2023, following discussions with the applicants, EPD issued an updated NOV, which allowed them to keep the unauthorized seawall in place while they attempted to obtain an after-the-fact shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit. On June 15th, EPD received an after-the-fact SADF permit application for the wall. And on September 18th, EPD received photographs documenting that the seawall and fence had actually been removed by the applicants. On October 4th, the applicants paid an administrative penalty of $2,000 to the Conservation Trust Fund for the construction of that unauthorized seawall and fence below the normal high. So here's a photo of that wall before it was removed, what it looked like, and also the uh, small portion of fence that is below the normal high. I'll also point out there is a drainage easement and an outfall pipe just below that fence uh, in an easement um, dedicated to the county. And then here's a photo of existing conditions as, after they removed the wall and the small portion of fence. And then here's the proposed site plan the applicants are proposing to construct approximately 84 feet of concrete seawall with riprap along their shoreline, approximately one foot landward of the normal high water elevation. The wall will only be a foot high and is being proposed to separate the yard from the riprap to ease their yard maintenance. There are no existing seawalls on either of the adjacent properties, but there are other properties on Lake Pine Lock with seawalls. There is some erosion uh, that we noted that was occurring along the shoreline. Um, as I mentioned, there is that existing outfall, and sometimes those can uh, cause an erosion problem. Um, the pipe will not be blocked or altered by this seawall. 
and staff from Orange County Stormwater Management Division have reviewed the plans and have no objections. Here's a cross section of the site plan. Uh, based on prior board direction, riprap and plantings are required. And so accordingly, the applicants will install native plantings um, waterward of the riprap and new wall. Some considerations for you. The project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 15, Article 6, Section 15 to 18, and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. Regarding notice, uh, notification of the hearing was sent to property owners within 500 feet, and we received no objections. Our finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 15, Article 6. EPA has evaluated the proposed SADF permit application and the required documents and has made a finding that the request is consistent with Section 15 to 18. Our action requested is acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the EPD staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2306016 for Juan Jimenez and Yasmin Castillo, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. This is in District 3, and I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Is the applicant on this item present? And if so, would you like to come forward and offer any, any comments? I don't see Yes, okay. Okay, all right, uh, thank you. Are there any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Uribe, would you like to offer a motion? Yeah, I'd like to file a motion for approval. Second, more. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Hall. We're going to uh, go to the next item, B3. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and Mr. Kozak, our chief planner from the zoning division, is going to come back once again. He'll be framing this item. Thank you again, and thank you, and good afternoon again, Mayor and Commissioners. This uh, item before you, we've uh, seen it a couple times, but we'll, as a refresher, we'll go in detail over the PowerPoint. So the uh, case number is VA 2306031, and this is also known as Orange Tire in Wales. This is the C1 zoning district and future land use of commercial. Addresses is 7525 South Orange Avenue. We'll see the location in a, in a moment here in northeast corner of South Orange in Royal Palm. Tract is a, a, a little under a, a third of an acre. And this is in District 3, and the commissioner has been briefed. Uh, the, there were a couple of requests, variances in the C1 zoning district. Um, one, to allow a rear setback of 2.5 feet in lieu of 20 feet for an existing tire shop. Uh, variance 2 has now been withdrawn, um, and the request was to allow a rear setback of 6 feet in lieu of 20 for two shipping containers. Um, the location here in the, the Red Star on South Orange Avenue, and closer in with the zoning, um, with uh, the commercial zoning along uh, South Orange Avenue, and some residential of, of right there to the east. This is the aerial map and the existing improvements. Uh, we'll see. Do zoom in on the site plan. This is a little difficult to see what's going on here. Um, a little bit of history. So uh, we've been here a few times. The Board of Zoning Adjustment Public Hearing was on June the 1st of last year. Uh, there was a community meeting on July 27th. Um, that was uh, no one in attendance for that one. The, there was a board called uh, public hearing on August 8th, which was continued to September 26th to allow for a, a second uh, community meeting, which was held on September 25th of last year. Uh, there was another board called um, public hearing on September 26th of last year and was continued to January 9th, uh, which is today, um, based on uh, the, some of the comments we received at that com second community meeting, and we'll talk about that in a second. And some of those uh, pertain to the site plan and elevations, which were submitted on the, the December 28th of really close to New Year's. This is the BZA site plan that was seen at the first in um, um, a public hearing for, for the Board of Zoning Adjustment. To the left in the uh, lighter yellow, those are the two shipping containers that were proposed with the rear setback variance now withdrawn, and a red shipping container was uh, proposed to be uh, removed, and all three are proposed to be re removed entirely. The variance one, which is the first middle red box, that's the rear setback of 2.5 feet in lieu of 20 for an existing stairwell. Um, and then we talked about the other prior variants. 
and some site improvements. Now, moving forward, a res the revised site plan, which I've uh, colored in some uh, for, for convenience, and so you can see to your left the variance number two withdrawn, the, the prior shipping containers replaced by a code compliant as per setbacks with a darker yellow, um, so an enclosed area instead as, as an addition. The uh, two other lighter yellow areas which were proposed and continue to be proposed to be uh, enclosed. Right now they're open uh, work areas. Um, work areas need to be enclosed. This was built um, in, in, a, in, in the prior days, so now the proposal is to enclose these two yellow areas, so you have the, the, all the yellow areas to be either enclosed or fully addition. Uh, the rear variance I pointed out in the prior sep site plan, two and a half feet in lieu of 20, and then we'll talk about other um, site improvements that um, is being recommended based on uh, discussions we had at the community meeting, including some landscaping uh, to your right, which is along Royal Palm, including trees and shrubs, as well as um, proposed landscaping along Orange Avenue, which is uh, towards the bottom, and that would be removal of some concrete area. And recently, in uh, January 1st, the, the zoning code has changed slightly, so now there, there's an opportunity to even have more um, green area by having some two feet of overhang, so essentially 16 foot uh, deep parking stalls instead of these prior 20 feet. So at least as what staff proposes, a five foot um, minimum landscape area with trees and shrubs along Orange Avenue. And, and then finally, at the rear, which would be considered the east, the um, two north, the north east corner and the southeast corner uh, implementation of shade trees and shrubs and uh, removal of um, other things including um, outdoor storage so we'll get that into detail so the existing elevations and as proposed at the bza the yellow are those open work areas to be enclosed um, and then we'll see as we move, no, that was the existing, now, excuse me, and now this is the proposed BZA elevation, so to enclose uh, the, the yellow areas. After the community meeting and after public input, the, um, the elevations were modified to include to your left that addition, so removal of the shipping containers. I would, I'd like to note that so far we haven't received the east, south, and north elevations to revise, but the, the south and north will essentially be the same, but the, the rear elevation will be obviously longer because of the addition that's now proposed. Here are the site photographs facing from South Orange Avenue. Uh, the arrows are pointing to the uh, shipping containers to be removed, facing southeast from South Orange from the front of the property as well, and moving farther on Orange Avenue, and then um, facing northeast on a, on a slightly different angle of the property in those shipping containers and open work areas, you can see. Again, straight on on the property, and the, a little better view of the two shipping containers in the north, and then the, the rear of the existing structure and the stairwell uh, facing south. And the, to your left, you can't tell, um, we'll point out a little bit, is an unimproved alley, and then the other side of that alley is some residences. This would be the view currently of the, from the, the unimproved alley facing towards the shipping containers to remove. So if you visualize these being removed and then the addition farther down, that meets the 20-foot rear setback. And here's the uh, unapproved alley. To your right is the, are the residences, and to your left you would see some, uh, some of the buildings, including a, uh, it's difficult to ascertain, but there's a black trailer there um, just on the other side of the, the fence to your left, as well as the open work areas. So uh, the existing conditions, uh, a little over 4,000 square feet of a tire shop with two covered open work areas on either side, built in approximately 1961, those shipping containers that I talked about, as proposed uh, and previously proposed, in the enclosure of two open, uh, cover, covered but open work areas, and then at that additional 532 square foot work area in lieu of the uh, initially requested shipping containers. So the cumulative total, a little under 4,000 square feet of enclosed work area. 
the request um, talked about variance one, the rear setback of two and a half in lieu of 20, and then talked about the previous request for the shipping containers and, and the setback variance. Staff recommended approval of, of the variance number one is special conditions and circumstances, particular to property, is the age of the existing improvements. The request is not self created, granting would not confer special privilege approval of the request and would be in harmony with the purpose intended of the code. Staff recommended denial of variance two, but um, as we've discussed already, that request has been withdrawn. Staff mailed 76 notices within an 800 foot radius. Uh, we did not receive correspondence in favor or in opposition. The BZA concluded that the approval of the variances would not con confer special privilege where the minimum necessary and recommended approval of them subject to six conditions of, in the staff report. And here's a little bit of summary of the two community meetings which I've pointed out already. The first one on July 27th, the second one on September 5th, and um, it, it was attended by county staff and um, six residents in attendance. <clears throat> the concerns included concerns about property maintenance, the shipping containers are inappropriate. The property is currently used for auto repair, not a permitted use in C1, and concerns about part the parking lot being used for the adjacent restaurant. We all know that the variance criteria, there are six of them, special conditions and circumstances, not self-created, no special privilege, deprivations of rights, minimum possible, and purpose and intent. Um, these uh, incorporate the conditions of approval that the BZA rec recommended. <clears throat> in orange would be modifications uh, to reflect the uh, proposed site plan that was uh, received on December 28th, and then modifying conditions 4, 5, 6, and 7, which relate to a number of th things, including, we'll see in a second, including landscape and um, the shipping containers. Condition two pertains to um, issuance of development permit. Three, the, the template for code standard. Four, uh, as it proposed in orange, would be some uh, clarification and cleanup for this condition. So prior to issuance of the permit to enclose the work areas and or for additional work area for the tire shop, all existing shipping containers and accessory structures shall be removed. Five, this pertains to um, the time to uh, required to submit a modified site plan that reflects the property lines per survey on file with Orange County. Six, as modified here in orange, some for clarification, and then um, as I move uh, further down, so I'll read it all, enclosed enhanced landscape and shall be provided along the entire length of this side street on the south property line along Royal Palm Avenue within the seven foot required landscape strip. This enhanced landscaping shall consist of understory trees planted 15 feet on center, supplemented with a continuous row of shrubs planted 30 inches on center within the landscape strip. Landscaping shall also be provided along South Orange Avenue with understory trees planted a minimum um, five foot landscape strip every 15 feet on center and shrubs planted 30 inches on center. A landscape plan showing the required landscaping shall be submitted with the permit for the enclosure of the outdoor work area. Um, a proposed condition seven, which essentially breaks off and makes it more readable for condition six. So more landscaping. Landscaping shall be provided at the rear of the property in the east area east of the building in addition adjacent to the north and east property line with a minimum of two 12 foot high shade trees with 22 three foot high shrubs planted 30 inches on center in in the area southeast of the building adjacent to the south and east property lines with a minimum of two 12 foot high shade trees with 22 three foot high shrubs planted 30 inches on center. Um, additional condition eight, no, addition, no shipping containers are allowed on the property. In addition, condition nine, no outdoor storage is all allowed on the property. The requested action in front of you is either deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's request with conditions. And I'll take any questions, thank you. All right, stand by. Is the applicant on this item present? Uh, would you like to make any comments? If so, come to the mic. He's waving on making any comments. Okay. All right. Um, are the members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing uh, on this item. We'll go to the district commissioner for a potential motion. Commissioner Uribe. Um, Mayor, before we move on to that, um, I had received some feedback from Mayor Foreager with the city of Belle Isle 
and we wanted to add um, condition number 10 and this is the proposed additions and enclosures of the existing covered work area shall be constructed with concrete block or stucco painted finished painted to match the existing building and that was um, condition number 10 um, thanks everyone for your patience on this it has been a prolonged case that has had some issues um, one that I would like to note to move forward, um, they have code enforcement violations right now for doing work that is not permitted on the property. And um, I'm hoping that the owners will get into compliance and do what's right. Also, um, did we ever discuss the no parking signs on the front of that Orange County right away? I know that we had mentioned that in our discussion. Do we need to have the county do well, that? We, we could discuss this now. Yeah, okay. I would I, offer that would any... go to Joe. Yes. So their, the, their right-of-way, which is off of Orange Avenue, is actually concreted in. I don't know, Ted, if he wants to show a picture. And they are using the bar next door for parking along there. And it is not safe. We've had issues with law enforcement. We've had issues with the neighborhood right behind this business. And wanted to know how we could put, I guess he's getting to the photo, no, no parking along the front from the fence to Orange Avenue is actually county right-of-way. But it's cement, so can we dig a hole? <laughs> um, this has become a major nuisance right. with the and I know we have. Homes. I know we have similar scenarios in other parts of the county where there's a paved, a, a continuous paved access, and, and we run into some parking scenarios and some situations there. Um, this would I, greatly help our law yeah. enforcement because that's where we need is right. more enforcement on this end. And right now, even though it is county right away, unless a code enforcement officer goes sure. out. And usually this happens at midnight on Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. But we get this so bombarded with vehicles. Yeah. I think that we can um, look to install uh, no parking signs um, uh, with, our, with our, either our sign crews or, or traffic engineering. Uh, and I think we would have to, I'm not positive, but I think we have to just bring that back on uh, one of our consent items for, for no okay. parking. This isn't a, um, Commissioner Wilson, this isn't a, a, a condition. It's just that this is a right-of-way that we have. Yeah. And if you look right to the left, there's a bar. And so what they do, this is an entrance to a neighborhood. This is filled with cars and people outside, and the law enforcement can't ticket, even though it's county right-of-way, because there is no, no parking sign. So, so I'm requesting an addition, no parking signs there. Okay. But it has nothing to do with the condition on this application. Joe, what was your hesitation there? Um, I was just uh, concerned that if we um, uh, start to install no parking signs just on paved access, that you know that can become problematic across the county because there's so much of that across the county. Where there's, you know, particularly in you know in the Taft area, there's just a, a continuous driveway, if you will, in front of some properties, uh, and that can just be problem may be problematic with trying to. Um, install and enforce uh, those, no, those no parking areas. But I'm looking at this one, and, uh, and I think that we have a limited area that we can identify um, fairly consistently, you know, no parking within right away from here to here, you know, with, uh, with the arrow designation, um, and, and create that no parking zone. That would be great. Yeah, it's just become, like, like I said, sheriff's office can't do anything mm -hmm. because it's ours, and unless we have code enforcement, we have no parking all around everywhere else. Right. We just... We need some help there because it's very, very dangerous. And this is a 50-mile-an-hour road. It's a right. five-lane DOT highway, and people are just hanging out there at midnight with no streetlights. Okay, thank you. Well, and, and um, we'll um, get back with, with Ted and, and circle around on the location for the, the no parking area just so that we're, we're certain we're getting the right spots. Okay. And, th and that had we had discussed asking you since you were here and kind of putting you on the spot, so thank you. <laughs> All right, so with that, I would like to file a motion for approval with the conditions set forth. All right, uh, just before we uh, take the action, I know that um, the owner of the property is here. Uh, I want to make certain that you understood everything that was said, and uh, if you understood everything, if you're in agreement or not, uh, Okay, if you can come to the mic, just want to, for the record, get an affirmation whether or not you understand what is being said here. If, can you come to the mic? My name is Sammy Kazma. 
And uh, the only thing is about the block wall she's talking about. Which block wall? The one behind the land? The condition 10 is the additions that you're adding. Okay. okay. You understand what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. All right, because we, we, we want to avoid something in the future if you say I didn't understand what, what was happening. Okay. All right, uh, so with that, Commissioner Wilson, did you get your question answered? Yeah, I think I was trying to clarify whether or not the parking, it's an overflow from a different business and unrelated. Okay, that's, that's what, what I was, was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If it was for the All right, uh, so we, um, well, with that, uh, Commissioner Uribe, uh, we have a motion. Uh, Second. Yeah. Second. <laughs> I, I hear Commissioner Gomez Cadero as well. Okay. The second then is uh, Commissioner Scott. All right. All right. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes and it is unanimous. All right. We'll move to the next item. Uh, this is C4. We'll open the public hearing on this item. Uh, Mr. Kozak, you recognize. Okay. Thank you again, Mayor and Commissioners. And Here's the PowerPoint. This is VA 2309073. It's an appeal public hearing. The, the applicant is Nanav Karem. This is the, in the A1 Citrus Rural District. The address is 14354 Ellerby in Winter Garden. We'll see the, the location in a moment on the southeast corner of Ellerby and Siplin. Track size is uh, a little over 1.1, a little at 1.1 acres upland. This is in District 1, and, and the commissioner has been briefed. There are three requests as part of this. The variances in the A1 zoning district. One, to allow an 8-foot-high fence wall and gates in the front yard in lieu of six along Ellerby. To, uh, number two, to allow an 8-foot-high fence wall and gate within the Clearview Triangle along Ellerby. And finally, to allow an eight-foot-high fence wall and gate within the Clearview Triangle along Siplin. This is in the, as a result of code enforcement. Um, the property is located, as I said, in the southeast corner of these two streets, Ellerby and Siplin, just located on Black Lake. The zoning, as you can see here, is A1, surrounded by A1. It's also surrounded by the city of Winter Garden. Uh, the property here in yellow, uh, the the building and a little bit of unique um, setbacks, meaning the front is there to your north and a street side, and then where there's a, a detached accessory structure there to your left, that's a, another side, and then the rest of the property. The site plan, uh, I, I know it's a little difficult to read. I'll go through it from top to, to around in the, the clockwise manner. Variance one is what I talked about, eight foot high fence and wall and gates. That's along Ellerby in lieu of six. So those are the clear view triangles, which, uh, and not the clear view, that is the front yard. So the front yard is the gray area, a little difficult to read, but the front is where I can I have that arrow pointing. So the front yard, that's variance one. Variance two is eight foot high fence, wall and gates in the clear view triangle. So those are the, the green triangles and those are the visibility. And then finally, variance three, the green triangles to your left off of Siplin, eight foot high fence wall and gates in the Clairvue Triangle. Uh, in red is the portion of the existing eight foot high fence and wall that needs to be re removed from the, the corner triangle. And that is not a, a, a request that can be asked for from, as a variance. Um, as a side note, this uh, is actual right out of the, the, the building permit for the the, the walls, fences, and gates that uh, indicated that all of these needed to be in compliance. So I'll talk a little bit more of that in, in the future here, but facing southwest from Siplin, this is facing towards the front of the property down um, this street here, and you can see those um, the wall at the bottom, and then there's fences, and then you'll see the gates in a moment. Now I'm just facing south and east from the, the corner of Ellerby and Siplin, towards the uh, fence and wall, and that's the, um, the corner triangle, that's the, the red area, which I pointed out in a, mo a moment ago. Here are the two gates that are located along um, Ellerby, and gate one is farther down, gate two is closer to us, and those would be the subject to the 
um, the, the height variance as well as the clear view triangles for those gates and the, the, the portions of the wall within the 15 foot by 15 foot clear view. Um, this is facing south from, from the corner, now facing towards the detached garage you can see there, and then the, the rest of the improvements. Facing east from Siplin towards that gate number three. And then from inside the property, facing northwest towards the corner triangle, which I talked about with that red area, and then gate three to your left. And facing east towards the, the street side of the subject property, and then to your right there is the detached accessory. This is the lakefront front lot I talked about. It's a corner lot. The front yard is Ellerby, and the street side is Ziplin. It was developed in 2021 with a, a little over 10,000 square foot home, and that 2,200 or so detached garage. The property was uh, acquired and built, uh, presumably by the owners in 2021. The, there was a permit issued in 2021 for a fence and wall. It was not installed per plan. It was expired in Jul January of 2022 since there was no final inspection because if one would have taken place, it wouldn't have met code. Um, code, code compliance cited the property owner in October of 22. Um, the, again, the fence and wall was not meeting the development standards. There was a new fence wall permit issued in now in January of 23, which was an install block per plan. And um, while that permit was still active, there was a as-built site plan, which indicates all of these improvements with, that I pointed out with the deficiencies in April of 2023. Um, the, the permit expired in October of last year since there was no final inspection once again. Um, and, and as a, a reminder, the requests are to allow a foot high metal fence wall along the front property line adjacent to Ellerby and with two uh, eight foot high metal gates in lieu of six feet. That's variance one. Uh, again, variance two, eight foot tall fence wall and gate along LRB within the 15 foot clear view triangle. And finally, the variance three, the eight foot tall fence wall and gate line uh, located along the side street property line adjacent to Siplin within the 15 foot clear view triangle. County engineer reviewed the location of the eight foot high fence wall that encroaches that 15 foot property corner triangle in the corner of the two streets that I indicated in red. That's the as I said, LRB and Siplin, they cannot remain as installed due to safety uh, concerns and they need to be relocated in meet code. Staff recommended denial of variances as there are no special conditions and circumstances. Requests are self-created, would grant special privilege. There would not be deprivation of rights. The variance is not the minimum possible. The variance is not har in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zoning regulations since the height and location of the fences, walls, and gates could impair visibility of pedestrians and motorists. Staff mailed 39 notices to adjacent property owners in a 500-foot radius. Staff did not receive correspondence in favor, but four correspondences in opposition to this request. The BZA concluded that approval of the variances would confer special privilege, were not the minimum, determined they were not in harmony with the purpose and intent of the zoning regulation since the fences, walls, and gates could impair visibility of pedestrians, motorists, and recommended denial. Once again, the, the six variance criteria, special conditions, conditions and circumstances, not self-created, no special privilege, deprivation of rights, minimum possible and purpose and intent. The request in front of you, deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's request with conditions. Now, since the BZA recommended denial of variances, but if so approved, we'll go over the, the potential conditions of approval. Condition one pertaining to um, the site plan and fence wall and gate details, except an orange clarifying the, the pointing to the right condition, condition four. Uh, condition two, pertaining to development permit. Condition three, uh, deviations. Four, pertaining to um, site plan modifications. And five, um, the time to undergo the, um, improve, the permitting and finalizing that. And then finally, they hold harmless for uh, the improvements here uh, that would waive um, liability coverage. And then once again, to remind that to the requested action is either to deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's re request with conditions. Thank you. All right, is the applicant on this item present? And uh, if so, a representative, would you like to come forward?
While he's getting that PowerPoint set up, I'll introduce myself, Mayor, Commissioners for the record, Brent Spain, Dariac in Spain, 1809 Edgewater Drive, Orlando, Florida. And as a preliminary matter, I'd like to congratulate my law school classmate, Ms. Holmes, on becoming the Deputy County Attorney. She has risen much higher than myself. <laughs> so congratulations, Georgiana, well-deserved. So I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon on behalf of Mr. Karim. I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation and get through this uh, within my time. I'd like to reserve, Mayor, hopefully just a minute if there are any public comments. So we've already seen the site location, but we're at the corner of Siplin Road and Ellerby. It's essentially an enclave of unincorporated property. It's rural and A1. My clients actually purchased the property back in 2016. The Siplin right-of-way used to split their two lots. This board approved the right-of-way vacation so the two lots could be combined and developed with a residential home, which was completed in 2021. This is an aerial, much like the staff report. And then these are the three variances we are asking for, and Mr. Kozak already went over them. The only thing I want to point out is that the area in red we would submit is not before the board this afternoon. In fact, the assistant county attorney instructed the BZA that that issue was not before the BZA, so they made no ruling on it. And we would respectfully submit that we meet all six criteria for a variance, which I'm going to walk through. So first, the special conditions and circumstances. I'm going to show you on additional photos, but there are special conditions and circumstances. Uh, first, due to the proximity of the site to Black Lake, the building site was required to be raised to avoid being flood prone. Additionally, given the proximity to Black Lake, the wetland area and the water table, uh, the Department of Health required the drain field and septic system to be in the front yard, and that those site constraints, as you'll see in the photographs, essentially render it almost impossible to put a meaningful fence in unless the height variance is granted. Again, it wasn't self-created. Those The need for these variances are a direct result of the increased grade in the drain field being in the front yard. Three, there's no special privilege being conferred. Uh, again, we're not denying anything that other properties can do in the zoning district. Fencing normally would be allowed. In fact, as I'll show you, three doors down, the property owner got a very similar variance because they have the drain field in the front yard. Uh, deprivation of rights. Again, without the requested variances, the Karems will not be able to install a fence or gate in the specified areas due to the presence of the drain field and the significant grade change. The fifth criteria, the minimum possible variance, again, you'll see from the pictures from the inside of the property that due to the significant grade change on the site, we'd essentially be rendered to have a two-foot high fence if we had to comply with the six-foot height, which any dog can easily jump over a two-foot high fence. And then lastly, the purpose and intent. Again, approval of the requested variances will allow improvements in the appropriate location that are in harmony with the purpose and intent of the county's zoning code, and they will not be a detriment to the surrounding area. This area is accessed by two dead-end streets, Siplin Road and Ellery, and the increased widths of the driveway, which I'm going to show you uh, with the gated driveways, adequately eliminate any site view concerns. In fact, on the site plan, originally it was going to be a 12-foot driveway. It's uh, in excess of 24 to 30 feet wide. So this is, the, on the left on the screen, that's a survey. The area in red in the circle is the drain field. Up in the top right, you'll see this was the site plan that was submitted. And again, you'll see the drain field circled in red. And then highlighted in yellow, the whole front of the property is surrounded by gravity walls due to the grade change. And you can actually see on the site plan, there's an over three foot change between my client's uh, final elevation and the elevation of Ellerby Street. And then on this site plan, I've highlighted it says 12 foot driveway, but the driveway was actually built substantially wider. And then the bottom right, you'll actually see this was the permit that did get approved. And you'll see that the fence, 
you'll see there's the gravity wall, which is a little under four feet high, and then you see my client's four-foot fence on top of it. That was approved. What ended up not getting built per plan was that the, the contractor put the wall and the fence within the view triangle. And again, I've just quoted a code section over off to the right. When there's a difference in grade change, you're supposed to measure the height of the fence from the higher grade elevation. So we would submit across the front of the property, the fence is actually compliant because the fence is actually only four feet tall. The gate would need a variance because the gate is eight feet tall to match the height of the fence. So here's a view from inside the property. The picture on the top right is looking toward the corner of Ellerby and Siplin. So you can see how high uh, the grade is, the finished grade of the site to have a buildable lot. You can see there's the gravity wall is barely visible, and then you can see the four-foot high fence put on top of that. The picture on the top right is from the driveway that exits onto Ellerby, and again, you can see the grade of the lot is almost at the top of that gravity wall. And then the picture on the bottom, that is looking to the right of the driveway. Again, you can see the site elevation is almost at the top of that gravity wall, and then the, the lot evens out as you move to the the far lot line. This is what it looks like to the front gate. You can see it was not built to 12 feet wide. It's substantially wider. You have easy visibility. That's the top left looking into the site. The top right is looking down the driveway. And then the pictures on the bottom left and bottom right are actually taken from the gate entrance. So you can easily see the stop sign to the left at Siplin and you can easily see down the road uh, toward LB, toward the dead end of LB. So we would submit there are no visibility issues with the view triangle. And then this is the side driveway. Again, we submit there are no visibility issues. Again, it wasn't built at 12 feet wide. It's substantially wider. And in fact, you can see that the driveway doesn't even exit out onto what I call the paved portion of what we loosely refer to as Siplin. It, it's actually not Siplin veering off to the east. But you can see there's a full car length to pull out on the bottom right picture. You can actually see a car parked in that area before it even gets on the uh, improved way, road, roadway area. So again, there's no visibility issues of coming out the side driveway. And you heard me mention a similar type variance. This is literally four doors down from my client's property. You can see my client's property at the intersection of Ellerby and Siplin in the picture. On the far left, the, the site in blue is the house that was granted a variance for being in the site triangle. You can see that's the approved site plan, very similar to my client. They have a septic drain field and system in the front due to the proximity of the lake. You can see the green view triangles on the permit site plan. They asked for a variance for a five-foot fence and six-foot tall gate in that view triangle. They had a much more narrow driveway than my client. Here's a picture of that six-foot high gate and the columns. The county approved that variance in 2021, and the staff uh, findings, a couple of them are in the bottom right. And the staff actually found that it met all six criteria, and significantly for purposes of this afternoon, I wanted to point out their finding as the special conditions, it's highlighted. It said the special conditions and circumstances particular to the property is a site constraints, such as the location of the existing drain field and septic tank in the front yard, making it difficult to install a fence that meets the site distance triangle required by code without the need for a variance. The staff also found that it wasn't self-created because of the obligation under the regulations to put that septic system in the front. All these new homes built along Ellerby are raised in grade. My client's site was significantly uh, raised. As you saw, there's a three foot drop between the grade and the street. I've cited a couple other variances that have similarly be grant, been granted, including additional height on the fence and the gate. And then for the record, I did want to introduce, because of the BZA, which I did not represent Mr. Karim at the BZA, there was mention that there was opposition, four oppositions. I think several of them came from the same property owner. But in advance of 
this afternoon's hearing, we did get letters of support from the seven uh, properties denoted on the overhead. So many of those folks are the ones in closest proximity to Mr. Karem's property, so I'd like to introduce those letters of support. And with that, I'll just wrap up and respectfully submit that we meet the six criteria for the variance. Uh, as demonstrated, the requested variances do not create any site visibility issues and are consistent with the Clearview variance that was granted for the property similarly situated just three doors down. Uh, additionally, without the requested variances, the Karems will essentially be deprived of the right to have a gated or fenced front yard. As you saw with the grade, if my client only has a four-foot fence from grade, if they have to be limited to six feet from Ellerby's grade, they're going to have a two-foot high fence in their front yard, which can easily be jumped. You can see my client has a Great Dane standing in the driveway right there, so I would submit a two-foot fence is not adequate barrier for that. Uh, we would ask respectfully for approval of the variances subject to all the conditions of approval in the staff report, with the exception of Condition 4, which pertained to the area in red as under the county's own code. Uh, that's an issue the county engineer uh, decides, and it wasn't actually an issue before the BZA are decided. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, but we appreciate your support. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Spain. If you'll stand by, uh, do we have any members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor, I have one speaker card, Rhonda Dexter. Please state your name and address for the record, please. You'll have three Dexter. minutes. <clears throat> I reside on Ellerby Street. <clears throat> this is, seems like it's been going on way longer than two years. When I leave my house on Ellerby, as stated, it is a dead-end road. I have no choice but to take a ride. When I get to Sipline, I have to stop because, again, it dead-ends into Sipline. I have to then, as they showed the picture of the stop sign, stop at it, look, right, to see if it's safe to, to pull out. I, all I see is a block wall. The wall, I measured it, it's <coughs> eight feet and seven inches tall. It only got taller. He got warned and he built it taller. Um, the metal part he added uh, sometime after the block part where he was told, you know, it's in the sight line. I almost ran into, or he almost ran under my truck, um, a gentleman on a recumbent bike. I saw the red flag on the pole. That's how we were both able to slam brakes and not have a tragic accident. A lot of people walk from Black Lake Preserve and Cypress Reserve and to down by the lake. It's a beautiful walk. They come down Sipplin, they turn left on Ellerby, and they make that walk to the dead end. They turn around and they come back. Now then, they're subject. They, you, they have to stop because it's a dead end. So before they can go out onto Sipplin on their bikes or their trikes or their whatever they're riding, walking, oncoming traffic is there. I, I, I don't understand how this has went on this many years, and I'm just, it's not safe. Um, I know Ms. Deborah Molsevich, sorry if I messed her name up, um, he stated he would have a homeowner's policy for a million dollars to cover any accidents at that intersection. She said, sir, that won't touch, that's not the tip of an iceberg for someone maimed. That's not, you know, it's not enough money. Uh, Mr. Kozak said, how can we trust you? Because you told us that you would take the wall down, you, would, you were going to do the setback. He, you didn't. So how can we trust you that you're going to carry a homeowner's policy? Then he presented a picture of a mirror. He said, well, we're going to put this on this tree over here uh, or on a pole, pole somewhere. And we're going to then ask people to look in that mirror to know if someone's coming around the corner or not. None of this is safe. None of this is safe. Um, he's, they, I love the way they keep comparing Mr. Jamie's home. Mr. Jamie is not on a corner. Mr. Jamie is not in the sight line. Um, it's, it's, you're comparing oranges to apples there. So, um, the, again, just the corner I, I, I cannot see. So I'm just asking that 
Uh, and he keeps saying he can see coming out of his drive. Like, that's great. I'm glad for you. But what about all the other people? <laughs> we can't see you coming out. And he, yeah, so it's, it's none of it's safe. Asking for eight foot, seven inch tall, none of it's safe. I, I would ask that you would, you know, keep Orange County safe. And right. Winter Garden, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Dexter. Are there any other uh, members of the public present who wish to be heard? I have no other speaker cards, Mayor. Okay. Um, then I will give the applicant or the appellant an opportunity for any rebuttal comments. All right, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to briefly respond uh, to the neighbor. One, her comments, much like at the BZA, pertain to the red area on the site plan, which, again, the assistant county attorney instructed the BZA that that issue was not before the board. What was before the BZA was the variance on the front. which on my plan is a yellow line straight on LRB and then the green triangles. The red triangle wasn't an issue before the BZA. With respect to the insurance policy comment, that's a staff proposed condition that my client agreed to. I would point out that the variance that was approved two years ago, three doors down from my client, doesn't include any such requirement. My client's also amenable to a hold harmless and indemnity provision as a condition of approval, something that the property three doors down also didn't need to do. And they most certainly, contrary to uh, the neighbor's comment, they most definitely needed a view triangle variance for that six foot high gate and five foot high fence down the street. And I just want to bring it back to this slide because this is the reason we're primarily here is we keep talking about how somehow this is eight feet, but from grade, it is a little bit over four feet, which is an allowable fence. And it's the fact that we have to have a drain field in the septic system in that corner and in the front of the property, and we had to raise the property over three feet to not be flood prone that we're here today. My client, can't have this gate as it is without the view triangle cutting through the drain field. And that's exactly what the county approved and this board affirmed three doors down. So we're not asking for some unique privilege. We're asking for something very similar to what the county blessed a few doors down again. So I appreciate your support. The Karems appreciate your support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spain. Uh, if you'll stand by, we'll close the public hearing at this time, and we'll open it up for any questions or comments by members of the board, and then we'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Scott has indicated a desire to speak. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, sir, you indicated that um, you wanted us to do what was uh, previous to uh, what you said. How, how far do you have exactly how far down it was? How far down the other variance is? Yes. Yeah, I have it on the aerial right here. So it is. So literally on the overhead, that the site outlined in blue is the house that got the variance. My client's house is the house with the pool and the detached garage to the left of that. But in terms of feet, do you know how many feet? Uh, I don't know how many feet. It's okay. Um, you researched this too for this presentation. Did you also research uh, what, if any, safety concerns were presented when those variances were approved? When the 2021 variance was approved? Yeah. Yeah, I actually have the staff report. I went back and reviewed that entire file. Okay, so what concerns were presented safety-wise? 
Oh, it's the I, exact I, same thing. In fact, staff said there wasn't a safety concern because the property exits out onto a dead end street. And that because of the drain field location, they wouldn't be able to have a fence in the front yard without the variance. So the, the mirror to help to mitigate the safety concern, was that something that you were proactive or something that you discussed with the neighbors? Yeah, the mirror was suggested by Mr. Karem at the BZA meeting that he would happily pay and put a convex mirror on the corner of LRB and Ziplin. That was prior to any public comment? Uh, I don't know if it was in his rebuttal. It was in his rebuttal at BZA. Uh, was there any public comment at the BZA hearing? There was. The only individual who spoke was the woman who spoke here today. So I guess my question is, when, when the changes were being made, uh, was there ever a thought to just put the mirror in? I mean, if, if safety is a concern, right, that's been brought forward, but even prior to that, there was a thought that there was a safety concern, why wouldn't you be a proactive to mitigate that? You get what I'm saying? Like, he's, he's suggesting, hey, I'll install a mirror, but if you're suggesting that you're going to install a mirror because there's a perceived safety concern, then why not be proactive and in, install the mirror? Do you get where I'm going? No, I, I understand your thing is if it if he's aware of it. If you can come to the if you can come to the microphone, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm the applicant. The only one I want to clarify it for you: the safety mirror was for solve the problem in the corner, where is not. And when the BZA say is not in the in the discussion, then it's fall off. The safety mirror not was for the uh, clear view in the gate, it was for the, where is the intersection, what uh, Orange County said, to put like when you go from a garage, put on the road on the other side, the convent mirror that you can see, even you can see like that now, but you can see in case, but then. The in, 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 in case to prevent an accident, correct? Yeah, but that's, but the, then BZA, I talk about the red angle, where is the septic? But the BZA say no, that's not even in our discussion. No, so what I'm, what I'm trying to understand here is you, you made some changes to your home, and I don't, you or your attorney can respond. What I'm trying to understand is you made some changes to your home. You recognize that there are safety concerns. Why wasn't the safety concerns taken into consideration at the time of the, the renovation construction? Do you, do you follow where I'm? Yeah, I, I, I do. And okay. I respect it but, and understand it, but that safety issue in the mirror didn't come up until just at the BZA meeting. In fact, we have not heard, and my client has been not been made aware of anyone else having a safety concern at that corner, the red corner, mm -hmm. which is where the convex mirror would be, which is not one of the variance requests, other than from the neighbor who spoke today who is the owner across the street. She's on the north side of Ellerby. Okay, so, so. insurance policy or not? Uh, safety concern, where or not, even with BCA, I would have did that because if you think of it, if someone you know loses their life or they're hurt, they're not going to care about whether. You, you get what I'm saying? If we're talking about the, even if it's a small possibility, that should be you know more forward thinking. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I'm not trying to be hard, but I'm just trying to. Do. I, I understand, and I think my client has indicated he's happy to do it. He obviously did not be proactive and do it before he even asked for the variance. But again, we're talking about. Sipplin essentially dead ends into my client's property. It comes down to where his southern property is or, or his western property on there. The Sipplin right away goes straight down. There is a paved private road that veers off to a few houses down a dead end street. And then Ellerby is a dead end street. Sipplin is even a, it's a substandard road. It's 16 feet wide. So we're not talking about, you know, Avalon parkway where people are going down this road way 55 miles per hour. People are traveling at a very slow speed on a substandard road. LRB does have 30 feet of right away, but is not paved to 30 feet. Understood. So my last question is, uh, you say your client is, is open to installing the mirror. Um, it, is your client open to installing, let's say you're approved, is your client open to installing a mirror and or appropriate signage based on the direction or input from county staff, not what you think is best, what we think is best from a safety standpoint. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. No further questions, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to ask Commissioner, um, was this design since the beginning to be that way? No, no? and um, you know, I actually was, you know, one of my questions, um, 
was really this, a lot of these cases that we get like this, they're inherited by an unsuspecting or unknowing buyer. Um, this applicant actually filled out, a, went through the process of filing for a permit and then didn't follow that plan, did oh. sort of what they wanted to do anyway. And so here we are as a result of a code violation. Um, so I actually wanted to hear from the county engineer, no, the county engineer, mm -hmm. about their perspective. We really rely very heavily on our county engineer and our staff mm -hmm. when they, when we see a staff report. And a, um, so just to try to get making sure. I know Brett was. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was county engineer at the time <laughs> that we looked at the former county Listen, engineer, Brett Black. There is nothing better than being surrounded by experts. So take it away. <laughs> Yeah, so if you, if you, um, I took a couple of pictures here at the beginning of October when this was first uh, brought up, and there is some confusion here, but this is the, um, the intersection that the, the resident did complain about, and there are significant safety issues here. If you, if you go through the next picture um, along the slide there, this is actually looking, if you're parked at that stop sign looking to the west, I think if you go one more as well. Oh, I actually do have a clicker. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> So if you go through here, that's kind of parked. If I'm, I believe I was at the stop sign on Ellerby looking to the south on Siplin. So that is a significant site issue. The, the mirror that was brought up would not be acceptable in that situation as a mitigation for public works, having a mirror in the right of way. So at that, from what I understand, at that um, BZA meeting, they no longer are considering a variance here. So, uh, and, and you guys can correct me, so what will... No matter what happens today, the gentleman here will have to um, redo this fence and wall to um, give a sight distance triangle here. Mm -hmm. So that is not at the t so that's going to happen uh, no matter what because that's not on the table for a variance today. So so that is going to be resolved from what I understand. Unless you know Ted, they're, they're shaking their heads. So the other issues are at the actual driveways, which are at other locations. So just to clarify that. Okay, I, I appreciate it. And I also want to make sure that my colleagues understand. I did, I did go by here, and the comparison property that was, um, I guess, previously approved, very different at grade and a very um, visually open, transparent fence. Not a wall. It's not, it's a not at the intersection, right? It's, it's not, not at the intersection, the and it's completely, you can uh -huh. see right through it. So it's a very, like, it's, it is an apples to oranges comparison. So, um, you know, quite frankly, like, understanding that this applicant went through the process, had made contact with the county, and really then when that happens, you have the opportunity to work with staff and work with our, um, our specialists and experts here to get this right, and they did not do that. And so um, at this point, having heard from residents, I know this isn't highly um, frequented, but it's still a place where it's public and there has been safety issues, and quite frankly, somebody's safety always trumps convenience and I you know I, I empathize with having dogs but I have to keep my dogs in my backyard not my front yard and that's just a part of the process when you have a, a particular lot that may not be um, workable for a front gate like this where I would say safety is a paramount concern um, the code is very very clear in this case and with that I'm going to make a motion for denial Second. All right, there's a motion uh, by Commissioner Wilson and a second by Commissioner Uribe. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you all for your presence this afternoon. We're going to move to the next item, item D5 at this time. We'll open the public hearing on this item and I'm going to ask Mr. Conkle, our Director of uh, Public Works, to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing D5, D5 is the Grassmere Reserve PD, Grassmere Reserve Preliminary Subdivision Plan. The subject property is located south of Ponkin Road and north of Orange Blossom Trail in the Zellwood Rural Settlement. This request is to subdivide 124 acres for 153 single family residential lots. The property is designated rural settlement, low density to two units per acre on the future land use map, which allows the two units, and is zoned PD as the Grassmere Reserve pl uh, Plan Development, which uh, allows up to 200 single-family detached dwelling units. Um, the aerial, there's the PD. The aerial shows the surrounding area developed with the single-family uses, including the Zellwood Station manufactured home park to the east. You can see the lot 
uh, outlined uh, on the map. And here we have the PSP, preliminary subdivision sh plan showing the proposed uh, lots and tracks and the uh, two points of access. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Grassmere Reserve PD, Grassmere Reserve PSP, subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 2 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any, any comments? Uh, good afternoon, Jason Mahoney, NV5, 6200 Lee Vista Boulevard, Orlando, Florida. We're the engineer of record for the project. We don't have anything to add, but we're more than welcome to answer any questions you may have. All right, then, Mr. Mahoney, if you'll just stand by for a moment. Uh, are there any members of the public present who should be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing, and we'll go to the district. Commissioner, Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer uh, any comments? Uh, well, I, I, I did have a, a question. We just discussed it um, a few minutes ago before the meeting. Um, We've been working on this for a while. You've heard, the board's heard this several times. Uh, the only, the, the concern that I have uh, remaining and they addressed for me was the, the significant amount of passive land, which is close to 30% because of the rural settlement being in Wakaiva study area. And so we talked a little bit about what you could do to ensure that the future HOA understands their roles and responsibilities with this large tract of passive sure, land. Sure, sure, that's correct. It's actually 70% open space. So that because this is in the Wakaiva Overlay District, there's a 70% open space requirement. So out of the 99.6 acres of developable land, nearly 70 acres is set aside for open space that will not be developed. And at the time of platting, when we come back and we do a plat to plat out this subdivision into the individual lots and tracks and roadways, we'll put those parcels into open space tracks and in that, in the, on that plat, we'll put some notes as to how those tracks are maintained in perpetuity. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. And Mayor, we've been talking a little bit um, when EPD is here about you know uh, preparing some sort of documents for these types of neighborhoods because I do a substantial amount of work with my HOAs and I just have concerns 20, 30, 40 years down the road that they have some guidance from EPD when you have this amount of natural Correct. land mm -hmm. to maintain. And so I'm going to keep saying that when EPD is here. I hope that we get to the point that we have such a document and guidance for these neighborhoods. They're, they're fairly commonplace in District 2, and so obviously I have a concern that we maintain the lands appropriately. And with that, if there are no other questions, I'd be happy to make a motion Second to approve. Second, all right, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Moore, second by Commissioner gomez Cadero. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you, Mr. Mahoney. You. Uh, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. This is item E6. We'll open the public hearing on this. And Mr. Conkle, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing E6 is the South Chase PD and uh, um, the affected area is uh, located uh, on South Orange Blossom Trail, south of Weatherby Road, uh, and just north of the 417. Uh, the request is to add uh, new uses to the existing Home Depot site to include outdoor storage uh, and rental of equipment, truck storage uh, and rental, and overnight parking of dual rear wheel vehicles on the site. Uh, this case is also related to the consent agenda item I-6, which is the 14th Amendment amended development order for South Chase development for the South Chase Development of Regional Impact, DRI. Um, the property is designated office on the future land use map and is zoned PD as shown there. The overall PD contains a mix of residential, commercial, and industrial uses. Uh, as you can see, some of those on the aerial. Uh, it also identifies the uh, residential areas to the north and east with uh, single family subdivisions. Here we have the PD land use plan. It's a rather large, but you can see the area of concern is circled in red. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the South Chase PD subject to the conditions.
it under the DRC recommendation in the staff report and also approve the associated amendment to the DRI development order. Uh, the mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in district four and staff is available for questions. Thank you, mayor. All right, uh, with that, uh, is the applicant on this item present? All right, coming forward. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I am Joseph Kovashesh, attorney with the Lowndes Law Firm, 215 North Eola Drive. Um, I have nothing to add at this time beyond the staff report. Uh, I will highlight that staff recommends approval, finding compatibility with the surrounding area and consistency. Um, as indicated in the staff report, this is an existing Home Depot site, and the CDR is simply to add um, additional uses to allow Home Depot's trailer and truck rental uh, operations to exist on the site. The associated amendment to the development order is to allow the amended land use plan allow those amended uses uh, to be incorporated into the development order for the existing DRI. I am happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for your time. All right, uh, thank you very much. If you don't mind standing by for a moment. Uh, with that, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor, I have one speaker card, Patty Hinckley. And please state your name and address for the record, please, and you'll have three minutes. Yes, my name is Patty Hinkley. I live at 2433 Southwest Gay Circle in Port St. Lucie, Florida. I'm here as representative. Um, I'm a property manager from the Semler Company. I'm here on behalf of South Chase Plaza Investors. The owner of South Chase Plaza is the left of um, the Home Depot site. And I'm here to... Um, we're, we're having some serious issues with day laborers and loyal, loitering problems on the south end of the property. Um, that is a direct result from Home Depot operations. We posted um, no standing loitering signs, but that didn't work. There are about 20 to 30, and I have to tell you today, there were a few more than that when I was on site to do my inspection. And I personally asked them to move along, but didn't dare to do anything further because there was so many of them. Um, in turn, I tried to call the local sheriff's department, and because it's a non-urgent issue, um, sat on hold for over 20 minutes, and I would have been late <laughs> arriving here. So we're not getting a lot of support on that end either. Um, and they're hanging out in front of the stores, which is not a good look for the shopping center. Um, they're you know, um, elderly people are very fearful. They drive up, they see them, and they drive away. Um, we finally hired uh, off-duty Orange County Sheriff's deputies to enforce this, but of course we can only get them as they're available and are willing to take um, the extra hours. Um, but Home Depot has kind of ignored our request to post similar signage on their property or share the costs of deputies. Um, this request, you know, Maybe they can, if they're granted this, be able to help us in some other manner to, to curb what's currently happening, never mind what's going to happen when they add other um, actions or, um, you know, equipment rentals and those sort of things. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hinkley, for your comments. Any rebuttal comments by the applicant? Uh, Yes, Mayor, thank you. So again, this is a existing Home Depot site. I think the issue of persons occupying the space, uh, you know, and the impact on neighboring or adjacent properties uh, is separate from the addition of these uses to the PD approvals to the land use plan. If, if there are any activities on site, obviously that's a matter for investigation. Um, and to handle appropriately. But here we're talking about the ability to amend a land use plan to add two commercial uses to a site that's already developed as a commercial business. Um, so wh while I, and we certainly uh, respect the comments from our neighbor and understand the concerns they've raised now, 
I think it does not bear on the fact that the staff has found this request to be compatible with the area and consistent with the county's comprehensive plan. So I respectfully ask that the commission approve both the development order amendment and the CDR. Okay. Um, we, uh, if any other board members, uh, stand by. Uh, if there are any other board, board members who have questions or comments, now would be the time, and then we'll go to the district uh, commissioner. And just as a reminder, I think I six was pulled from this morning to go along with this item. Uh, it was pulled from the consent agenda to go this afternoon. So, depending upon uh, the action this afternoon, we'll have to uh, take action on that as well. Okay, uh, Commissioner Uribe. Um, yeah, I did. I did want to do a follow up. Um, unfortunately, what she said is a major problem that's happening. And are, are you guys or your client committed to having no overnight parking or, or to be able to assist in this? Because honestly, they're going to go back and deal with the same issue. You want to get your your additional change, but what are what are we doing to help? Because I'll tell you, I have the Home Depot on Colonial, and it has become, it's actually gotten worse. It's breaking into people's homes. I mean, it's a lot. And unfortunately, can you get a commitment, no overnight parking? Can you get some, no loitering, anything from your client that's willing to assist to not make this become more of an issue for that community that's around it and those businesses that are around it? So I do want to clarify that a part of the request is to add temporary overnight parking to the list of approved uses for the, the trucks, for the, the additional items. So overnight parking is a fundamental component of the request well, to change. I meant semi-trucks, like trucks that not part of the equipment there. But what, what I worry, and we may have to get staff, is when you allow that usage, does it allow for semi-truck overnight parking? Because it doesn't start separating trucks that they rent and trucks that can come and be on the property yeah and and how is that enforced can we can I ask staff to for some assistance because I'm seeing this grow um, more and more like on the the Sam's you and I split that area Sam's on mm -hmm. uh, Central Florida Parkway and now we have overnight truck parking there so I yeah where where does that line define because now could we have just semi trucks parked there because it's Overnight parking is overnight parking. It doesn't say if you rent it from us, it could be here. But and if I it's think one of the conditions was to. The, there is a condition of approval yes. uh, with respect to that condition of approval number eight. And that mm -hmm. reads um, proposed areas for outdoor storage and display equipment, rental and leasing with outdoor storage and truck rental leasing shall generally be uh, as located as shown on sheet C006 uh, as provided in the concept plan for CDR dot dot dot. Uh, temporary overnight parking of dual rear wheel vehicles uh, for unloading shipments only shall be limited to the rear east of the building. Um, so I, I believe that would otherwise preclude. But but that falls on their indoors. I mean, their enforcement. I mean, really. Uh, I mean, it, it, fundamentally, first, it's the property owner's responsibility to ensure compliance with that. And then the, the county staff ultimately would be a backstop to, um, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. re responding through code enforcement. Okay, so. Yeah, that I worry about your enforcement issue. Commissioner Gomez Cadero, questions? Yeah, I will, yes, thank you, um, Mayor. I'm going to table this. Uh, I'm going to request Mayor to table it a little bit so I can talk to Ms. Patty outside because this just raised up and it's important for me to understand that. But um, wasn't that discussed yesterday that they're going to be, like, parking in the back of the, of, the, of the building so there is no home there and so on? That doesn't look... You know, terrible the, from the, the front. The condition of approval makes reference to a, a specific area on the area. site plan mm -hmm. where this where the activity for, for the truck parking and leasing would otherwise be limited to occur. So it's not the whole yes. site uh, where that can be used, but it's limited to a, a portion of the site only. Okay. So may you gonna Okay. So please? we'll give uh, Commissioner I'm sorry, Gomez Cadero um, the opportunity to, to caucus with you outside. I would talk to him uh, and we'll, so we'll we'll table this for now. We're going to go to the next item, and we'll come back after your Thank you, conversation Mayor. with her. Is that okay? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. May I just okay. get uh, a bit of clarification from Commissioner Uribe about her comment, just just so I know how to respond go, to it? Go ahead. So, is is the concern uh, because uh, as you heard, the condition of approval 
limits delivery trucks, those semi-trucks delivering supplies um, to the facility to park in a specific area, unload, and presumably if, if they come overnight, you know, there's, there's some period of time the trucks can be there. Is the commissioner's concern trucks not associated with the Home Depot yeah. using the parking and, lot as a campground? And, yeah, and I believe okay. Mr. Weiss said it would be a very specific area, so it's not the whole parking and that whole area that, that you, you know, you, you guys obviously, when it's a Home Depot, it's huge. But it's going to be a specific area on the lot, uh, Mr. Weiss, if you could. Because I, I, it would at least, I mean, obviously it's Commissioner Cordero's district, but it would be nice to see right. at least an area designated where that would happen so that you can't just say right. your whole front parking, you know, if they dropped off a load and it's 11 o'clock, they can just spend the night so that they don't have to get back on the road till the morning. Or is that going to be designated area specific on the property? Understood. Um, Commissioner, I, again, I believe condition of approval number eight uh, makes reference to a, a, a sheet on the plan set that uh, generally depicts the location where that would be allowed. And so it's not the and whole only, lot. It's not the entire property. Okay. Okay, okay. so we're going to move to, uh, we're going to table E6, but now we'll come back to it. We'll go to item E7. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item. Mr. Conkle will ask you to frame this item. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> Public hearing E7 is an amendment to the Silver City Properties PD. The affected portion of the plan development is located on University Boulevard, west of Forsyth Road. The request is one waiver from code to allow an eight-foot setback for accessory structures along Forsyth Road in lieu of 30 feet to accommodate the drive-through canopy of the proposed new fast food restaurant. The property is designated commercial on a future land use map and is zoned PD uh, as the Silver City's properties plan development, uh, the aerial shows the uh, area developed uh, primarily with commercial uses. You can see the uh, area uh, highlighted on the northwest corner of Forsyth and University. Here we have the PD land use plan with the affected area in the bottom right corner. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Silver City properties plan development subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. Uh, Mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 5 and staff is available for questions. Mayor. All right. Is the applicant present on this item? If so, would you like to uh, make any comments? Okay, she's coming forward. Vivian Monaco with Watson Sloan. 390 North Orange Avenue, Suite 1800, Orlando 32801. Uh, I'm just here on behalf of the applicant to say that we agree with staff's recommendation and request that if there's any public comment, uh, reserve time for rebuttal. Thank you. All right, Attorney Monaco, if you'll stand by. Uh, do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. And Commissioner Bonilla, unfortunately, could not be here, so I'll move the item as uh, recommended. Second, Scott. Second. We have a motion and a second. Second by Commissioner Scott. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. A motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to item Thank E8. You. Thank you, Ms. Monaco. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on item uh, E8. Uh, Mr. Conkle, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing E8 is the Alafaya Trail Student Housing Plan development. The subject property is located on Alafaya Trail, north of East Colonial Drive and south of La Conatosa Trail. The request is for two waivers from Orange County Code to increase the maximum building height from five stories 60 feet to five stories 70 feet and to reduce the major street setback from Alafaya Trail to 10 feet. Uh, the applicant is requesting a continuance to this case. Um, to allow time to further discuss the major street setback and the request for continuance is to February 6 at 2 p.m. All right. Um, is the applicant on this item present? If not. Um, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers on this item, Mayor. Right, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, we'll move to continue the item to February the 6th of this year at 2 p.m. Is there a second? Second, Wilson. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
Motion passes and it is unanimous. We continue to February the six. All right, we'll open the public hearing now on item E9. And uh, Mr. Conkle, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing E9 is the Hamlin Plan Development PD Unified Neighborhood Plan, Hamlin Reserve Preliminary Subdivision Plan, uh, a portion of Parcel B, the Hamlin Retail Development Plan. The property, the subject property is located west of Hamlin Groves Trail, north of Porter Road, and south of New Independence Parkway. Uh, the request is to remove two conditions of approval, which required replatting of the property. Uh, those, were, those conditions were part of the uh, development plan approval by BCC. The property is shown on the Horizon West land use map as Corporate Campus Mixed Use District and is zoned PD as the Hamlin PD Unified Neighborhood Plan. The aerial shows the uh, area surrounding with uh, residential development uh, with commercial uses entitled for the remaining undeveloped areas uh, along the frontage of Hamlin Groves Trail. Uh, this shows the development plan uh, with the approved uh, retail commercial buildings. Um, the recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Hamlin Plan Development PD Unified Neighborhood Plan uh, subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners, I've been briefed in this request. This case is in District 1 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to make any comments? All right, he's uh, waving on making comments at this time. Are the members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. Right, then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, would you like to make a motion? Move the requested item. Second, you All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. A motion passes and it is unanimous. All right. Thank you. No. We'll move to the next item, which is F10. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and uh, we're going to ask Mr. Jason Sorensen to come back, our chief planner, to frame this item. Mr. Sorensen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This next item is a board called rezoning. This is a rezoning to go from R3 to R2. This is a location at East 15th Street. The property measures 0.71 acres. Uh, the proposed use is a duplex and a quadruplex. This property is located in District 2. This is uh, the future land use currently. It's low, medium density residential. The purpose of the rezoning is for consistency with the future land use designation. The current zoning is R3 and the proposed zoning is R2. This is an aerial of the subject property showing it north of East 15th Street and west of South Highland Avenue. 148 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have not received any responses. A community meeting was not required for this request. At the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there were no speakers present to speak on the matter. The Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending that the board make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the requested R2 zoning. However, there is now a proposed restriction to limit development to two units per building for compatibility purposes. The staff is available for any questions. All right, uh, thank you. Is the applicant on this item present? Uh, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Okay, she's waving for now. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers on this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. Uh, Commissioner Moore, is, uh, it is her district. Do you want me to? Uh, Correct. At, at this point, uh, you all have briefed Commissioner Moore, correct? Yes, and this restriction actually came from Commissioner Moore. Okay, so she's uh, in a, uh, agreement with that. Uh, in her absences, well, I see her coming in now. Yeah. So can someone just? I'm I'm happy to go ahead and file a motion for. I mean, uh, if do she's we just expect right her? There, I don't know. You know, so okay. she's, she's, she's just right there. Just to... Okay. Here she goes. Was she coming in? She's coming back. Okay. <laughs> All 
All right, Commissioner Moore, we're on uh, item F10, and uh, this is regarding uh, the Jocelyn Bing application. We understand that you're well aware we're at the point. Uh, would you like to offer a motion? The requested action is on the screen. Uh, right to, to limit to maximum two years for Billy. Yeah, I've been working pretty closely on this project, and, and uh, there, there's some other issues. We're happy they're building over here. I don't know if she's here. Happy. Okay, we're happy you're building there. We just had to, to make sure this, this area was safe and a few other things. So with that, I'd like to make, make a motion to approve. Second, you, Reby. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, with that, then we'll move forward to the next item on our agenda. This is item G11, and we'll open the public hearing on this item. Uh, we're going to ask Mr. Sorensen to also frame this item. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this next item is a future land use amendment and a rezoning. The future land use request is to go from commercial to planned development, commercial, medium, high density, residential. And it's a rezoning from uh, PD substantial change to change the designation from a hotel and medical office to multifamily and medical office. This is for a property located at 9350 Turkey Lake Road. And the proposed use, again, is a conversion of a 215 hotel uh, units to 215 multifamily units. The uh, medical office will remain. Associated with this request is a text amendment to Future Land Use Policy 8.1.4 to record the development program in that policy. Again, the property is located in District 1. This is an aerial of the subject property showing it on the west side of Turkey Lake Road north of Sand Lake Commons Boulevard. Again, the future land use currently is commercial. Proposed future land use is PD, commercial, medium high density residential, and the zoning is PD within the Sand Lake Commons PD. This is the Sand Lake Commons land use plan, again, changing the designation for the subject property. There is one waiver associated with this request, is to reduce the living area from 500 square feet to 320 square feet. 110 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,400 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have not received any responses. A community meeting was held on May 30th, 2023, with 14 residents in attendance with concerns for parking, traffic, and school capacity. At the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there were no speakers. The Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending that the board make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and adopt the requested plan development medium high density residential future land use, adopt the associated text amendment, approve the associated small scale ordinance, and approve the associated PD substantial change to the Sand Lake Commons PD. Staff is available for any questions. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, Mike is yours. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, Ryan Abrams, I represent the applicant. Uh, I'm based in Fort Lauderdale at 888 Southeast 3rd Avenue. Uh, I appreciate you all giving your attention to this matter today. Uh, I do have a presentation. I, I, I first want to just say that the staff's presentation, I think, covered uh, the what we're asking for, essentially, and, uh, and the staff you know, staff agree that there was a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, I also uh, would like to say that that's something we agree with completely. And um, I'd first like to just see if there's any questions I can answer uh, before I go through anything else. Well, uh, you can go through your presentation if you like. Okay, sure. You know, no problem. Questions will come after that if there are any. All right, no problem. Okay, so. It's a seven acre parcel. It's part of a larger land use plans, the Sand Lake Commons PD. Um, we're seeking here a future land use element map amendment. Uh, and the change will be from commercial to planned development. Most of the other parcels in this area are labeled planned development. And uh, a lot of the other, there's a combination of uses here ranging from multifamily nearby to a hospital and medical office buildings. And uh, this, current, this building is currently a hotel. There's also medical offices on site. Uh, this would be a one-to-one -one conversion of these hotel units. It's urban infill development. Um, and it accomplishes one of the primary goals that the county has, which is to uh, have smart growth rather than, uh, rather than more sprawling growth it, it 
this is this is a re adaptive reuse of a building that's already in a job center so it serves that county's primary policy and also fills a need for a diversity of housing options as i said be a conversion of 250 hotel i'm sorry 215 hotel rooms to 215 studio apartments this is a concept plan the uh, the layout of the site will remain unchanged there will be improvements to the finishing of the exterior and the interior of this structure the rooms will obviously have to be uh, completely changed from hotel rooms to uh, livable studios these are going to be high quality finishes these studios um, there's going to be kitchen there's going there's going to be high quality uh, cabinets um, it's going to be targeting young working professionals in this area many of the workers in Orange County come from uh, Osceola County and Seminole County this fills a need for more affordable smaller housing for those who are working in the area particularly you know think think medical workers think you know firefighters police young police officers teachers right there are many young uh, single individuals who need housing as they are uh, as they are rising in the workforce and uh, there needs to be more studios out there and there's not enough currently this is the pool area Uh, these are the floor plan layouts so we did ask for a waiver on the room room size from 500 to 320 the smallest unit is 326 square feet uh, the largest unit is 384 square feet these are studio apartments for individuals uh, one, or, one or two people would be living in these units this is a rendering of the interior as you can see there's a lot that can be done with that space to make it uh, someone's home these were some comp uh, some comps analysis that was done uh, li earlier this oh, it's 2024 so about August of last year and you have the studio comps in this area uh, are $1,764 for a studio ranging up to three bedroom comps at 3,159 for a three bedroom apartment. Our projected rents are 1200 per month for these units. Uh, and we can do that because they're smaller and many cities across the country are doing, are, are encouraging smaller unit size, not, not necessarily encouraging, but there's, there's just a, there's a need for more than one type of housing option, not just three bedroom, not just two bedrooms, not just single family homes there's a lot of young single family single people out there who need a place to live and they don't need a two bedroom they don't need to pay 2447 a month uh, for a new two unit unit bedroom the, a, a studio apartment close to uh, university drive uh, and and close to many of the job centers in our area uh, is sufficient for them and is ideal for them uh, this project also I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this project because it doesn't happen enough that you have adaptive reuse of a building that is underutilized you know hotels are there's just there's been less of a need for the hotels there's there's so many in the Orange County and Osceola County area that many of these older hotel buildings are just underutilized and they are at threat of of um, you know falling into disrepair over time not that this not that that's what's happening here but you know there is a, a use that is uh, higher and better and we are seeking to to uh, make that use a reality so this fits within the vision that the uh, this tri-carry tri-county area has there's the regional housing a re regional affordable housing initiative which is a 2018 which culminated in a 2018 report um, key of the key findings in that report it found that uh, not just there's different tools in the toolkit for affordable housing there's not just income restriction uh, income restricted housing there's which involves public dollars you know uh, deferrals on uh, on impact fees etc 
There's also a diversity in housing types that is needed. And that report found that 59% of the region's households have only one or two people. It found that there are many households who do not fit the industry's demographic profile and no one is stepping in to meet their demands. It found that uh, we must also have different products matched to our industry or to our current or emerging lifestyles and the practices of the housing industry. Such housing units may be smaller, rethought in terms of their content or location and consequently delivered at a more varied price, uh, at more varied price points. Uh, it also found, um, it, one of the goals that it came up with was to diversify, and that is to encourage diversity of housing types, mixed income development, and sustainable building and infrastructure techniques. A couple other points that it found, there has been a material shift away from home ownership toward renting. These are rental apartments, after all, that we are proposing. And it also found that very broadly, the goal is to increase overall production so that housing at multiple price points becomes more widely available. There's also the Orange County Housing for All 10-Year Action Plan. Uh, in that action plan, the county uh, expressed a number of goals, included our uh, diverse, diversify housing stock, expand the types of housing being constructed. Again, there's not enough studios on the market. There's more of a, uh, there's more production in the two fam the, the two bedroom space, the three bedroom space. Uh, there's the goal to eliminate regulatory barriers to the development of housing, modify the code and policies uh, to increase housing development opportunities. And there's also target housing development incentives in areas close to transit and jobs. Again, this is right near International Drive. It's not far from downtown Orlando. It's a ideal location for urban infill. And here are some other examples of smaller studio apartments from across the country. Um, one is near to home in Miami. Miami, they're, they're uh, allowing micro, they call it micro apartments, uh, going, going down to 325 square foot per unit. Actually, it's 300 to 300 to 400 square feet units. And, you know, it's been, it's been an answer to, one of the answers to affordable housing. Um, there's also a, there was an affordable housing challenge that New York City put on and one of the first, one of the winners, the first prize, win, first prize winner was the tabletop, uh, and their smallest unit was 293 square feet. Again, it's not, it's the target, um, it's the target resident that we're after. It's young working professionals. These are, these are not for families. These are for people who are up and coming and who need to be able to have something affordable and in a good location. Here's a, more, uh, a case study that was from nearby, Kissimmee. The Red Lion Hotel was converted uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, and those units are 350 square feet. So a near-to-home example of this being done and being made a reality. So this just, goes, this just shows some of the other uses in the area. Again, we're currently commercial. We're just asking for a future land use map amendment to convert the commercial to plan development to allow a mixture of uses on this property. This meets several goals in the comprehensive plan. One, a few are here on the screen. Objective 1.1 uh, calls for smart growth and to concentrate in the urban service area. This is well within the urban, urban service area. Another is uh, FLU2 uh, and FLU 2.1, and it encourages urban infill development. There's FLU 1.4.10, mixture of uses at the intersection. That's important here because before this proposal, there was only commercial uses at this intersection, and this would propose a residential use, which would align well with the existing uses there. And, and going on to FLU 8.2.2, it encourages a diverse mix of uses and housing types, and that's what we're doing here. It's a studio apartments that are not in common supply here in Orange County. The zoning will not change. It's, it's going to remain PD. 
However, the land use plan is going is being amended to add uh, multifamily residential. And that's all I have. If there's any questions, happy to answer them. Okay, is that the conclusion of your That is the conclusion of my okay. presentation. Okay, stand by. All right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have uh, members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, uh, then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to our commissioners for questions. Um, and as we do that, um, I do have some questions for you, Mr. Um, Abrams. Abrams, yes. <laughs> Ms. Abrams. All right, first, uh, with the $1,200 a month proposed rent, uh, projected rent, is that going to also include the cooling and heating and utilities or no? Good question. And my understanding is it does not. It's uh, projected to be another $150 for, for those. So it would be $1,350 total, including that. Okay, and you uh, mentioned and just, that. And just if I may also, the, the other studio apartments in the area, the new studio apartments in the area coming online now are going for 1800 a month. All right, and you mentioned that um, it would, yeah. these units will have high-quality cabinets and some other things. Are there other amenities on the property? Yes. Uh, there are, there's... This comes with an amenities package, including fitness center, pool area. Um, the, there's lounging areas. There's um, they have a walkway that they're putting in, as well, like a greenway on the side of the property. Um, there are. Is there anything I'm leaving out there? Let me consult my client real quick. Hello, everyone. If you can just give us your name. Uh, Marcelo Aramendi, 2891 Banton Road. Um, on the amenity package, we're going to have a co-working area, a clubhouse. We're going to have a gym. Uh, we're going to have a pet washing station. We're going to have a dog park, a uh, locker for Amazon packages. And that's, uh, that's besides the pool and the um, outdoor space. And... Uh, Presently, the size of the rooms uh, for the motel, what's, what's the square footage of the rooms now? They, they are as they, uh, it's, the, it's the same floor plan, but okay. the units are going to be converted. It's a change of occupancy under the floor building code, so. Okay, so you don't, you won't move walls around, so you're just making it right. work. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and there are no public dollars going into this project. This is fully private funded as well. All right. Commissioner Uribe. Um, yeah, I, I didn't get how much. What's the square footage on the on the units? So it ranges from 326 square feet to 384, I believe. That's your VIP room at 384. Yeah, I take That's, that. Room. I, I would take that room. Okay, because I mean, and you, I was looking at your rates. You were 1,400. Thir uh, it's 1,200 rent, and then we're anticipating 150 for utilities. So 1,350 for 300 and. 50 square feet of living area that our market analysis is um, it shows that that's what the market will bear wow that's almost 350 a square foot that's insanely high for a studio that you're calling I mean that's very very tiny and I know that you said I, I, I'm kind of bothered because you said housing for all this is very high when you look at the square footage of what you're talking about you're providing these these are smaller than your standard hotel rooms right now I mean but it's I, it, but it's in a it's in a an important area a jobs there a job center near internet it's right it's like a stone's throw I, from international I know where, drive I know so where it is, yeah. it's a it's a it's you're not just paying for space you're paying for location and these are going to be qual like they're planting courts countertops you know 
um, nice finishes, stainless steel finishes in the bathrooms. Like this is this is going to be these are going to be quality finishes in these rooms. Um, it's going to have to look nice because it's going to be tiny. So um, my question is: Are is this? Are you encouraging just? You're just saying: Is this limited to two adults? I mean, I'm I'm hoping that you're not including children to live here because these are not good circumstances to have any child live as a condition to be thriving. I mean, what are, what's the parameter of what you're going to rent for? I, I am, I'm just sorry, I'm really bothered at your housing for all comment because this does not fit in what we as a county are doing housing for all. Housing for all is that people can live and work in an area, not pay for, for a, a, a it's, that's smaller than a garage. That's, I mean, that's, that's and really college students get more space than that. So yeah. if you can kind of explore, cause I, and then you're also, by you I can address that you too. You have a dog park. So you're saying you even want an animal to live in these conditions. You're going to allow animals to, I mean, can you please elaborate a little bit more? Well, that, yeah, the housing. Oh, can we get our presentation back up? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so as for, let me address the housing for all comment, okay? Because what I was saying is a, di a diversity of unit types. Uh, so what the studies that the county has done in the past five years have shown is that the, uh, the majority of those living in the county are uh, in need of a, a a room, a unit for one or two persons, um, and what the one of the goals, one of the tools that 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 those studies uh, show are in need is a diversity of inventory on the market. So there is there are different needs out there, um, just like you you know you have very nice restaurants and then you have Different, different caliber of restaurants, right? It just depends on your target resident, your target client, okay? And what we were saying is our, our target person, our target resident, our young working professionals, one person working in the area, either a medical professional, a teacher, a doc, you know, maybe not a doctor, a nurse, okay? Maybe some, some um, hotel service workers, from the international drive area. These people are currently having to drive, a lot of them are having to drive from Seminole County, from Osceola County. These are, by Orange County standards, aff affordably priced, competitively priced studio apartments. And it serves the county's goal of a diversity of, of housing types because studio apartments are a need and they're an underserved need currently. Um, it wouldn't be for me, I have three kids and a wife, it wouldn't be for me, it wouldn't be for a lot of you, but think about when you graduated perhaps and you were just getting a start. I don't think I would have, I wouldn't, personally I wouldn't have a problem living in a studio apartment right out of college that was affordable compared to other items on the market. Now, as to the units themselves, um, by current standards and trends in markets across the country, in areas that are becoming more more crowded, there's more population growth. Units are getting smaller. In New York City, units, New York City units can go to 300 square feet. In Chicago, they can go to 200 square feet. And and, and the Florida Building Code doesn't require more than 120. Okay. Um, my follow-up question is um, amenities. So. These things aren't big enough to have a washer or dryer, so you're going to have services on your premises for, for that? Yes, we're going to have a laundry facility. And uh, one thing that I wanted to add, on the 150 for utilities, that also includes Internet and cable. It's not only okay. um, electricity. Well, and okay. And I, and I did want to tell you, the standard is about 225 a square foot. You guys are charging almost $4 a square foot for this unit. So... When you talk about affordable, it's actually higher than when you look at one bedroom. Is that apartments. from? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, 
The, uh, the 1700, 1778, that's the standard for the area. For 800 square feet, yeah. Uh, they're not 800 square feet. They are more in a little bit about 500 square feet. Um, those are for new construction. And the 1778 doesn't include any type of utilities. I think we, uh, on, on your calculation, you're adding the 150. Okay, they're, to still, the they're, still small, they're still cheaper per square footage. It's just yeah. to sit there, I, I, okay. It, it's, I, uh, we know that it's higher per square foot, usually Smaller apartments are higher per square foot. You can compare to the ones in Osceola. They are 350 square feet. They're charging $1,100 uh, plus their utilities. It's not something that is up above market comparing to, sur to the surrounding areas. Um, but it's, it's an option for someone that is looking to pay $1,200, um, $1,300. In this area, there are not a lot of options out there that are even close to that number. Okay. Um, also, I did want to ask um, staff, that's a transportation problem area, lots of traffic in that area, and now you're going to be adding multifamily units. Have we had a transportation study done to this area? There, there was some analysis done, uh, Commissioner. Uh, parts of um, Turkey Lake are, are failing. Uh, so as they would come forward, they would have to do a proportionate share uh, agreement for um, any uh, insufficient uh, areas along along Turkey Lake Road. Yeah, because that's a, I know that's a problem yeah. area. I mean, having get gotten stuck there. No offense, Commissioner Wilson. You know. <laughs> so okay. I mean, I just. I also want to add there that there was a study done by the engineering department, and they found that the current project would result in eight less trips per day. Okay, I mean, Commissioner Olson, that's all the questions I have. Do you want to know who's next? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, uh, the mayor just said that Commissioner Cordero. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you say that the utilities are included? Cable is included? Cable and internet. On the utility. Cable, internet, um, light water. bill, and water? And power. And power, okay. Well, for the fee. Uh, huh? pay $150. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred and fifty dollars for the fee, right? But it's included in the rent, yes. right? That's what uh, you said. It's uh, twelve hundred plus the one fifty. Plus. Okay, so everything is one fifty. Yes. Extra, like twelve hundred yes. and one fifty. Thirteen fifty. Okay, thirteen fifty. And that's okay. That's in the number of all the. Um, that's based on the number of all the apartments that are rented or, or that will vary because you have, I don't know, many empty and you have to divide that with, no? That's the average. That and the, uh, because of the sizes of the unit, um, we cannot go higher if we, even if we wanted to because then we are competing with new construction that has, they have larger floor plans. Mm -hmm. So the only way for us to keep lower rents is mm -hmm. by having smaller units. And what did you say about the pets? Commissioner, you asked about the pet. Yeah, he didn't answer. Oh, oh the pets, we do have a, a dog park. Um, not many residents choose to have pets, um, but we do offer. But they are allowed to, to have it in the they, apartment. They are. Uh, they have to be small. Um, mm. And we have to have a place for them to, to walk around, run around. To walk around and and we cannot have them enclosed in small units. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Let's see. Where are we? Commissioner Moore. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm assuming you're business people and you did some market analysis. What, and you may have already had some of this in your presentation, but what gives you confidence that you'll be able to rent? Because you can hear my colleagues here, you know, struck with the, the small size. What makes you think that you'll be successful based on your market analysis? Um, we have compared this property with uh, many successful properties in Osceola County. They're not that far from here. Um, we have other conversions happening. Uh, right now we have one also in Osceola um, across that property that uh, Mr. Abrams showed. Uh, we have another conversion happening in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, the rooms on that one are smaller than this one. This is an extended stay hotel, so they're a little bit larger than uh, the traditional older type of hotels. Um, we have another office building converting to apartments in the downtown Atlanta. 
Um, and one of the solutions we found to have lower rents was to have smaller units. And, and to us, the cost to have smaller units, it's higher, it's not, it's higher per square foot um, to build than to have larger units because we have everything concentrated in one space, one heating and cooling, we have one kitchen, everything is part of a smaller space. So it's also a little bit more expensive. No, I understand those arguments, but back to my question, which would be, uh, are any of those occupied, what's your occupancy rate and those units that are existing, or uh, facilities that are existing? Average is about 95%. So you said land and some of these other places, how many units do you have there in each of those locations uh, that you listed? In Oklahoma, we are doing 204. I'm sorry, Homa what? Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, okay. Yeah. We're doing 204 studios. You say um, you're doing, so it's not... No, that one we just started. Okay. Um, we have 120 in downtown Atlanta, um, 151 in Kissimmee. Uh, we have 112 in Miami. Um, they're all either office or hotel commercials. And you said you're over 90% occupancy? Yes. And why did you choose this area, my final question? Um, we checked what was available in the market for someone um, that wanted to uh, move, move by themselves without having to rent a, an apartment with a roommate. So we always look for places where uh, one bedrooms are five, six hundred dollars over what we can offer in the market. So we have higher occupancies because we have a much lower rent than the uh, standard in the area. It's an option. Not everyone chooses to. No, I understand. I understand. Apartment. Well, I've been waiting to say this all day, but um, actually, when I first moved here from going to the University of Michigan, uh, <laughs> I had. That's why I'm wearing yellow today, by the way. Um, yellow and blue. But um, I actually, I could still remember. I had a little efficiency apartment for two hundred eighty-nine dollars a month. It was over in District Four, by the way. Well, how long ago was that? Oh, I'm not telling that. <laughs> yeah, 10 years. No, it was not 10 years ago. Um, but anyway, you know, I just, I did want to say that for two years, we, you know, Commissioner Wilson had the national champion with a child there from Georgia. Now this year I have it from Michigan. So the right side of the dais is doing pretty well, and we're waiting for FSU and UCF down this way. And um, if I have bags under my eyes, it's because I stayed up all night. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just add some All right. Comments? So, Commissioner Scott, uh, we're going to keep it moving. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Gentlemen, good, good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Hey, so uh, you mentioned that uh, you said your target was like, you know, service industry workers, tourism workers. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you said that target, did you look at like the salary for these workers? The, the what? Sorry? The salary, like what they make. Um, I, um, the average in the area is about... Thirty-eight thousand, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, no. For uh, entry jobs, I think that that's it. The the area median income is about fifty-eight thousand, but we're not considering families. Okay. We're considering um, tenants that are starting in the workforce. All right, and so I want to make sure that I understand uh, what the cost is. Is it eleven hundred or twelve hundred? What is the base? Twelve hundred. It's twelve hundred. All right, so if it's $1,200, um, and then you said that the the rent was included, or sorry, the, uh, the utilities were included? It's, uh, it's $150. $150 extra. And so is that for water and electricity? And uh, internet and cable. So $150 for water, electricity, and cable, likely. And internet. Yeah. Okay. And... So I, I go back to my colleagues, just the size. You guys reference Osceola County. What research did you guys do for Orange County specifically? Oh, I know the the owners of those properties. I have been to those properties. I can give you the names. No, they, I, I get that. You're, you're, but you're referencing these examples in Osceola. Did you yes. look to see if there were any examples here in Orange County of what you're proposing? No, not in Orange County, right? No, I, actually, I, I, I don't think there there is a a precedent in Orange County for for this. Did you look though? Yes. Well, we spoke we spoke to staff as well. 
that's no. So staff is yeah. for for us, and they aid you in the process. But you're coming right. to us, so I mean, you're the attorney. You do the due diligence. What work did you do, independent of staff, on your own to see what is on the market here in Orange County? I mean, we we relied on we relied on the representation of staff on that one. Okay. So going forward, uh, I, I know of uh, a, few, a few properties that are. Um, working as a hotel, but uh, they're doing monthly rentals. Okay. And uh, they added kitchens, um, and they're acting as an apartment that is on a monthly basis. Where are these properties at? Um, there's one that is close to, close to downtown uh, here. Do you know the name? Um, I, I can give you the name, yes. I don't remember exactly right now. You're fine. But so I can give you the name. The reason why I'm asking you these questions is there are a number of properties, uh, some of them in District 6, I'm sure they're elsewhere, but I'll speak to the district I represent, uh, that provide a larger square footage for a cheaper rate. I'll give you an example. There's a property built in maybe like the 60s. It was owned by the church, Hope Mayor, and and they were charging um, 500 and 550 for 606 square feet uh, up until COVID. After COVID, they changed ownership, and now they charge 1,100 and I think 1,200 again for 606 square feet for a two-bedroom, uh, one-bathroom apartment. Uh, when you look at uh, what folks make in the tourism area, um, I think many of us have worked in those spaces as well. Uh, they're not making $20 an hour, at least not all of them. It's usually $15, $16, $17 an hour, assuming they don't have a tipped position. And so, when you talk about the 30% that someone that you want someone to be at. Uh, I'm just wondering if you guys couldn't look at maybe a better option that allows you a little bit more square footage. As an example, if you're going to make a change to the property, maybe tear down one or a few units to allow just a little bit more. Because looking at these renderings, um, this is tight for someone who, you know, male or female. And I'm assuming this, this lower picture here um, to the left, upper left hand corner, is that like the closet for where clothes would be? The lower picture on the screen. Um, in front of the in, in front of, like there's a plant right behind yes, it. Yes, that's the closet. That's the closet. And so where would, would they put their stuff? You know, um, I think this would be functional, yeah, maybe for a college student, but if someone's maybe in their 20s, they've been out a couple years, um, it, it, it's a great option. I'm just wondering if you guys couldn't look at how you could maximize the space to provide a little bit more. Because, like, you know, you're referencing another county and what they're doing here, but we're not Osceola County. We're Orange County. You're referencing other states. And so um, I always tell folks when they're doing things, yeah, you want to look at the numbers, but uh, dip your toe in the water and look in the community and make some phone calls. Put your eyes on it because there are different perspectives that are lost in the data. We get so focused on the data that we forget the people. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I'm just wondering if you guys didn't consider uh, just additional research or due diligence to figure out where similar apartments, because if I can get something for $1,100, uh, a two-bedroom, one-bathroom, double for the same price, why would I get something smaller if that makes sense? Um, just to be clear, that closet in front of the door is a double bed closet, so it's, it, you don't see it on the picture, but it's a larger closet. Okay. Um, for the for the rent, um, that's why a lot of people are driving an hour to get to their jobs, because it might be uh, $1,200 in another location, but if you're comparing this area, they're all over $2,000. Um, so maybe in a studio on the other location is $500 uh, because that's also the cost of acquiring the property and doing the renovations. Um, the, the issue with mixing two rooms is that it becomes very expensive because uh, when you buy a hotel room, you buy it by the room. When you combine two rooms, then you start, you're already starting with twice the cost uh, for that unit. And uh, once you get to a point where you're your bases are too high, then you're competing with the new construction. And then you cannot compete with the new construction. And they also have much higher rents. Um, the finish is not the same. Um, that's why um, this, um, this type of solution has been successful in, in other, not only counties, but states. A, and we were only mentioning Osceola because it was the closest one that we knew of. Um, but are, there are many other states and counties um, that are doing the same. Okay, I, I, I get that. What I'm trying to impress upon you is this. 
you're buying a hotel and you guys are a business owner. I'm not going to knock you. At the end of the day, you're in business to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to impress upon you is that, you know, don't be so focused on your ROI that you forget that you're trying to provide a service, which is housing, a critical service. You, you have an existing, uh, you know, hotel, motel, whatever the, the – and you're trying to keep it as original design so you don't have to knock down. But it's, it's, a, matter, it's a matter of framing. And, and, and if you could make some adjustments, maybe if it just taking out one unit, it allows you just to expand that square footage. I just want you to think of that going forward. Obviously, you've, you've put a lot of work into this project now, and hopefully it's successful and it's adopted. But if you, as you move into potentially doing similar projects in Orange County, I was just impressed by you to look at other places that are cheaper because there are places that provide a larger square footage for a, a, about a cheaper price or the same price that you're providing. Granted, those places may require a waiting list, and these are decent places that don't require um, low income. You know, there's no, it's, it's just a waiting list, but anyone can take advantage of it regardless of their income. And so just I would ask is as you uh, plan to bring future projects to Orange County that you do more due diligence in finding out what Orange County needs compared to what other Orange County, other uh, counties have. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it does. Um, okay. We always try also to think for the people that will be living at the property. Um, one thing we implemented here was to have full kitchens. A lot of people are doing cooktops. Kitchenettes, yeah. Small, very small, uh, not a full fridge, not a microwave. Um, that actually feels like a hotel. This is a small unit that actually has everything that a house has. Well, not a house, maybe an apartment. Um, but it's just that the space is small. Everything else is there. Okay, and then your colleague, you were going to make a comment, but you stopped it. You couldn't make what your comment <laughs> Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Kevin Harris. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to make the comment that it, it's a very specific target market that we're going for. It's people that are, you know, w when you go to the restaurants or you go to some of the hotels or you go to the hospital and you interview the staff and ask them how, far, how long does it take you to travel to work, a lot of them are travelling 45 minutes an hour, an hour and a half to work. So that cost of transportation, both on time and money, is quite high. So what they're also looking for is some quality. So, you know, we're producing a relatively high-quality space. You talk about the rent per square foot is very high, but the net rent is very low. Our net rent, compared to anything else that's equivalent standard, is very low. We're coming in at 1350, including utilities. When you look at the comparisons, it's 1800, excluding utilities. So I'm saying the product that we're providing is for people who are looking for this type of quality. I, I remember when I was a young architect starting out, I would love to have stayed in a place like this because it's not just about the bed that you sleep in. It's about the amenities package, and you've got almost everything you could possibly want in your apartment building. You've got a pool, you've got a gym, you've got a clubhouse. You've got a, you know, a lot of the, the young people are trending with, you know, before they have families, they test it out on a couple of dogs and cats. And so we provide the facility for, that, for those people that want it. A lot of people are excited about, you know, the ability for people who, don't, you know, just fresh out of college, just wanting to start a life. As you said, you started with 200 and whatever, $280 a month. This is the $280 a month version, just, you know, 10, 15, 20 years further on. So, you know, I think we're providing a very unique product. If you look at global trends around the world, it's all moving towards these micro-apartments. In New York, they're busy building apartments with no kitchens right. because it's about people eat out most of the time. It's, you know, if you think about the people that occupy the space, they're working ridiculously long hours anyway. They come home, they just want to have a quiet, nice, comfortable place to sleep, maybe grab a meal for breakfast, maybe get a takeaway. But again, you know, you're providing them with all these amenities, okay. that, yeah. which is what you I, want. I hate to cut it off. <laughs> but we got several other items. Okay. I think this one we. Uh, uh, kind of we're beat. excited about it because I think it's fulfilling I, a need. I, I, that I hear you. Know, but uh, just are you guys going to retain ownership of this in management? Yes. yes. No, oh. Not management. Ownership. Okay. All right, Mayor. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Um, in that we close the public hearing portion, uh, Commissioner Wilson, you kind of heard um, the presentation uh, by the applicant at this point. There was an item that was pulled this morning, uh, I-6, and um, I'm going to ask staff to just kind of explain uh, what I-6. 
That was with South Chase, Mayor, so that one already went through with the Home Depot? Okay, so that was with South Chase. Right. Okay. And that will, well, that was with the Home Depot. Okay, it's not this one. Okay, all right, so Commissioner Wilson, we'll go back to you, uh, District Commissioner. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I want to, first of all, I really want to thank um, Mr. Abrams. We had a community meeting. Um, you all are familiar with this area. It is, there's a hospital. Um, there are some medical offices. And then the next closest thing is a post office. There's really nothing else walkable. So, you know, obviously my, my concern was spot on the exact as the concerns that were raised here. And I continue to still be concerned about um, about the size, right? Because I think even though we understand that this is being, the, the, the goal is it's gonna be targeting a single young professional. But what I know as the district commissioner is that those are actually families. That the people who work at our restaurants and at our hotels and that are driving in and looking for housing, it is, those are families. So when I look at that room and I think about a family of four and a dog, it gives me terrible anxiety that we are lowering our standard for what the county requires for a living space. And the county does require 500 square feet. And so this application comes with um, the request for substantial change and that also comes with the, um, the ask of the waiver. Um, my question is, would you be able to move forward with the project if the waiver was denied and we went with what our county standards are, which is that it would be 500 square feet? Uh, we do have a limitation of two people per unit. So even if someone wants to live uh, with a family, they won't be able to. Um, yeah, how, how is that? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be around uh, much. No, that's an unenforceable. We, yes, <laughs> based on the lease, that is enforceable. Uh, we have to have the name of everyone living at the unit. So then we just hit if, them out. If they're not living, uh, we can do an eviction. Um, it's same with pets. They have to register the pets. If, uh, if that can happen anywhere, they can have a limit of four people and leave eight. That's, no, I understand. We I understand. Have to I think. What we I, can. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I think you know. First of all, I just want to tell you, I, I am a strong believer in redevelopment in this type of infill project. But I do think it's really critical that it's the right place and the right time and all those things. And so, this area, you've seen it. It's right by I four. It's right by Turkey Lake, which is a disaster. I don't know if I can visualize this being residential in the way that I think is being presented, and that concerns me. I heard you talk about the amenities. I would like to know where you're putting a dog park on there because if you keep the parking lot the way it is and the medical office is in the same parcel, I don't, I mean, where's the dog park gonna go? Because I, and I just, like I said, I, I really want to get behind this, but it isn't what we do. And I, I did research and I asked um, staff to, to tell me, um, do we have an example of this anywhere? And we do have an example, but they did not go below the square footage required. For a residence, and so I think that's that's illustrative for me, and I think I would be willing to potentially move forward with part of this request, but not with the waiver from the square footage. Can can I? I'd also like to proffer uh, a condition of approval, uh, capping the use of each unit to two occupants per unit. I don't know if that's but okay. I understand that that's the intent, and I think we have so many great conditions of approval that have gone through with really good intention that just sit on a piece of paper somewhere and then get argued later on in a, you know, a, a lawsuit. There so could what, be a covenant to a recorded covenant. A, no. Fully, fully okay. agree that that's, right. but then I think, you know, I understand that that's the goal. Um, I still think it changes what we, we don't, we have not done this as far as decreasing what that square footage is for this type of use. And so for me right now, what I'm ready to do, and, and if you, want to continue it and we can maybe get back together we can do that I, I am willing to kind of stand strong on the waiver um, at this time okay all right and uh, just from the county attorney and staff we have no obligation I would request I'm sorry I'm sorry mayor Hold on. okay we have no obligation to um, accept the waiver Right? No. According to our, our all, code. Mayor, this is a comprehensive plan amendment with a small scale, so the board does. Miles? Thank you. Um, this is a comprehensive plan amendment, so the board does have discretion within the scope of that action. 
And then with the PD, the waiver is likewise, with the, with the associated rezoning, the waiver is likewise discretionary by the board. Okay. Commissioner Wilson, you have a motion. May I also just request a, I don't have, a, I would love to see the comprehensive plan amendment adopted tonight, but I would request a continuance as to the PD portion, the, the waiver portion. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I think if we're moving forward with the comprehensive plan adoption, that it's a denial for the waiver, understanding sort of that, that meets the goal of it making that use without lowering our standard. Okay. I think we're going to request a continuance. However, the... the okay, unfortunately, yeah. um, your time is up. <laughs> At this point, it has transitioned to a conversation between the members of the board. Sure. Okay. And so... Uh, Commissioner Wilson, your motion is? Uh, to uh, make a motion for approval of the comprehensive plan update with a denial of the waiver. Second, you read me. Okay. Uh, John? Um, Mayor, just to be clear, if, if, if the board's considering that, um, you would be approving the uh, comprehensive plan amendment. Um, so the first part of that, uh, with respect, and, and that would obviously be associated uh, 814. Um, approval of the ordinance, and then the last on the screen, the last bullet um, would be approving the PD, but not including the waiver within that. So, um, I mean, I, 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 it would be, staff would recommend if you're going to take any action today, it would be both the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning. If there is a desire to continue it, um, don't, don't take any action on either of them, uh, continue the case as, as a whole. Or deny it, right? Of course, that's an option for the board as well. <laughs> do you, All right. Do you want to continue? Got it, Commissioner Wilson. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think we all had concerns, right? Mm -hmm. I think we all had concerns. I think that, you know, if those are insurmountable, we'll go ahead and continue. And then that way, if we can get back together. But I just want you to hear where those are for all of us. You know, it's, it's certainly something that I think is, is important to understand what we have done in the county and what we want to continue to provide our residents. Okay. And the second, Thank are you. you okay with amending the motion? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, I just want to make sure the clerk is clear what the motion is at this time. All right. We have a motion and a second. Need, all wait, in wait, favor we need say a, I'm aye. sorry. We need a continuation date, right? Is there... To continue. Um, Mayor, commissioners, um, beyond, uh, if, if I don't know how much time you may be looking for. If you're looking for March, um, you have March 5th and then March 26th as the two meetings. If you want to kick it out at least a few months to allow time what for was the What were the dates again? Uh, March 5th, alternatively March 26th. There are your two dates in March. And, of course, that would be at 2 p.m. All right. We probably should go to March 26th then. All right. At 2 p.m. Yes, Mayor. That's the motion. That's the motion. Thank you, All Mayor. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. Thank right. you. Good night. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll move to the – we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the table item. And was it E – Mayor, that was E6. E6. Public hearing E6. We're going to go back to E6. Go back to E6, and Commissioner uh, Gomez Cordero, um, yes. we were at. Okay, we have a potential motion from Commissioner Gomez Cordero. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the motion? Thank you, Mayor. So I motion to approve subject to DRC recommendations included in staff included in staff report and for applicant that shall post no lettering, no soliciting signs in the four locations agreed upon at, at the January 9, 2024 BCC hearing for CDR 23.05167 prior to using the site for any C2 or C3 uses. And there are the, there are the sites for the signs. Second, Uribe. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Georgiana, did, did you hit your button reference this item? I, or, or I did. It was on the previous one. I wanted to get clarity on the continuance for the PD. But we okay, did. but you got it. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second on this item. Any further question or comment? There being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 
Uh, the motion passes, and let the record reflect that um, Commissioner Wilson is absent and uh, Commissioner Bonilla. All right, uh, Mayor, so. Mayor, if I may, on that item, yes. um, just it, the, the motion included approval of the consent agenda item? And uh, the consent agenda All right. Item. Okay. That was. Uh, Mayor. Mr. Okay. All right. Mayor. Can I have a, just a clarification? We're going to approve the 10 conditions and then Gomez Cadero's Correct. new Document condition. Recommendation from the DRC, right. yes. Right. Okay. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I think we're clear. All right, so now let's see. I think we'll catch back up to, where were we? H12? Yes. <coughs> yeah. We're on H12, and so I'll open the public hearing on this item, and Mr. Sorensen, you'll recognize. All right, thank you, Mayor. This next item is a future land use change and a rezoning. The future land use request is to go from rural agri agricultural to planned development commercial, and the zoning request is from A2 to PD. This is located on Boggy Creek Road, and uh, the proposed use is 130,000 square foot self-storage facility, and we are located in District 4. Associated with this request are two text amendments. The first one is to um, establish the development program and policy FLU 8.1.4. Also, there is a text amendment because this would also include a, an urban service area expansion. This area is within the uh, Boggy Creek expansion area. This is the uh, uh, property highlighted here um, in relation to that expansion area. This was approved on January 10th, 2023. And it does allow for properties to come in as a small-scale amendment and not to have to do any special studies to be asked to become part of the urban service area. This is an aerial of the subject property located south of Lake Nona Boulevard and west of Boggy Creek Road. The current future land use is rural, and the proposed future land use um, is planned development commercial with the proposed expansion of the urban service area. The current zoning is A2, and the proposed zoning is PD. This is the land use plan for the Boggy Creek self-storage PD. There are wetlands on the west side of the property, which will be unaffected. And there are two waivers associated with this request, and it is applicable to the 760 feet along the south property line. The first one is to reduce the PD boundary setback from 25 feet to 10 feet and reduce the buffer from 15 feet to 10 feet. 383 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,300 feet from the subject property. To date, we have received zero responses. A community meeting was held July 18, 2023, with four residents in attendance expressing concern for the waivers along the north property line, which have since been removed by the applicant. Additionally, there was concern for the proposed cross-access vehicular connection to the north. At the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there were no speakers. The Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending that the board make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and adopt the requested plan development commercial future land use, adopt the associated text amendments, approve the associated small-scale ordinance, and approve the associated rezoning to PD with two waivers from Orange County Code. Staff is available for any questions. All right, thank you. Um, is the applicant on this item present? All right, coming forward. Yes, Mayor and Commissioners, Rebecca Wilson, 215 North Eola Drive. I appreciate your time and attention during this inclement weather to push through this agenda, and we agree with the staff report and its conditions and just would like the opportunity to um, address any concerns that may come up. Happy to answer questions. All right, Attorney Wilson, if you'll stand by. Uh, do we have members of the public present who should be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time and uh, we'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner gomez Cadero, for a potential motion. Thank you, Mayor. I approve, I approve. Let me see. Approved subject to the 19 condition of approval, including the two waivers from Orange County Code. All right. So that's your motion. And there's a second by Commissioner Uribe. Uh, any further question or discussion? Let's hear none, see none. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wilson, for your presence. We're going to go to the next item on our agenda. And this is the final item for this afternoon, and we're going to ask um, Mr. Mitchell Lasser to come forward as we open the public hearing on this item. Um, this is uh, an administrative item um, that requires our attention today. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Lasser to uh, frame the item. With that, you recognize. 
Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, this afternoon, um, we are going to um, go over the Community Development Block Grant Action Plan. Um, our presentation outline today will cover um, our background, uh, a little bit about the CDBGR um, DR basics, the timeline, the action plan development that we had to go through, um, talking about our unmet needs analysis, citizen engagement, use of funds, program overview and project selection, and finally, next steps and the action requested. So Hurricane Ian um, touched down on September 28, 2022. Um, the effects were felt across the state of Florida, 16 inches in rain, of rain, 8 to 10 feet of, of um, peak storm surge, widespread damage to infrastructure, homes, and a local economy. County faced immediate challenges and emergency response. Flash flooding in Orange County damaged roadways and rescue operations um, that were necessary. The impacts to Orange County from housing, there was reported damage to to over 10,000 housing units through FEMA and flood insurance uh, claims. Infrastructure experienced major damage related to stormwater and utility systems. <clears throat> Economic revitalization, SBA business uh, loan information reported over 1,000 business applications um, issued as a result of Hurricane Ian. Estimated damage in Orange County was over $300 million. HUD awarded Orange County $219,712,000, uh, $191 million in CDBGDR grants were for unmet needs, and $28,658,000 were awarded for mitigation, which was a 15% um, set aside that we are required to have. HUD funds are typically allocated to the state of Florida, usually for disaster um, of this nature, but Orange County received direct funding from HUD. Um, we were designated as a most impacted and distressed area, and we were one of four counties most impacted by Hurricane Ian that received direct allocations, and you can see on the chart at the right the other counties that received uh, direct allocations. Some CDBGDR basics. It's a flexible set of funds to carry out a wide range of activities re related to disaster relief, long-term recovery, restoration of infrastructure and housing, economic revitalization, and mitigation of risk. Some of the major goals of the CDBGDR um, is to address unmet needs relating to housing, such as repairs to single family or multifamily units, replacement of, of house, housing that's extremely damaged, new housing construction, infrastructure such as water, sewer, or drainage um, system improvements, public services such as job training, mental health counseling, and economic revitalization such as uh, small business loans, improve mitigation and resiliency, and ensure the funding and the programs prioritize underserved areas and, and populations and vulnerable, and, and vulnerable populations. Project act activities must be directly or indirectly related to Hurricane Ian. Some funding guidelines, 70% of the funds must be spent on activities benefiting low to moderate income individuals or areas. So a low to moderate income area must be a census tract where greater than 51% of the households in that tract is designated as a low to moderate income household. So 80% of uh, income for um, a family of four would be $70,200 as an example of the income range. At least 15% of the funds must be spent on mitigation activities to increase resiliency to disasters and long-term risk, reduce long-term risk. So the grant requirements are to develop this action plan. Um, for that, we have to do an unmet needs analysis, um, citizen input and engagement, and a proposed use of funds. We must have a public uh, access um, uh, via our website that we must maintain throughout the grant. 
period. And we must develop an implementation plan, which is administrative uh, plan that has to have our, our administrative requirements, procurement and contracting, and inter interagency coordination. This is an internal document. Our timeline. So we are, we are moving through our timeline and we are getting closer. Um, I wouldn't say to the end because it's a, it's a six year grant so we will be here for a while, but we are at least um, making headway and, and moving forward. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actions remaining later on in the presentation. So our action plan development process, talking about our unmet needs analysis, citizen engagement, use of funds, and program overview and project selection. Some of the key components of, a, of developing this action plan was our unmet needs and mitigation assessment. Um, the data gathering that was required, the evaluation of the state of housing, our disaster impact, the citizen input and engagement that we undertake, uh, key components of the plan to address unmet needs, determining the most appropriate activities to fund, and finally, the proposed use of funds based on the unmet needs and mitigation and citizen input all played a part in the allocation of funds. HUD requires data from four unmet needs um, from housing, infrastructure, and public facilities, businesses. Some of the data sources that we had to use were FEMA, um, Small Business Administration, U.S. Census Bureau, from our local um, uh, uh, Orange County, we uh, collected data from our county departments, our jurisdictions, our public housing authorities, and our community partners, advocacy groups, continuum of care providers of homeless services, and affected county residents. So some of the unmet needs and mitigation assessment demonstrated the impacts of, the, of Hurricane Ian on Orange County from housing, infrastructure, and economy. Um, and this chart, you can see how much impact we had. The amount of funds available were through um, FEMA, SBA, um, flood insurance claims. And then what is left over um, after that is our, our unmet needs that we uh, need to address through our CDBGDR grant. So focus groups with community partners and organizations. Um, we had a survey that was made available to the public via our website in three different languages. It was active from September 25th through November 10th, 2023. Uh, we had over 800 responses. We held 13 community meetings um, through September and November of 23. And the priorities that were identified was in housing, homeowner rehab, new construction, infrastructure, stormwater drainage, water and wastewater improvements, public services, housing counseling, mental health, and job placement. Just some of the pictures of some of the um, 13 meetings we had in all the districts. So use of funds. Um, this uh, chart shows how um, our, our allocation of program funds are um, correlated to meet our remaining unmet needs. Um, housing obviously had the largest unmet need. Uh, infrastructure was second. And then um, economic revitalization really had, had the smallest percent of unmet, unmet need. Of course, we do have a mitigation set aside, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then public services, um, based on some of the, um, the uh, needs that we discovered and, um, and, it, and was revealed through our assessment process. Administration and planning. Um, administration is 5% of the grant, and there's a small amount for planning that we're gonna talk about. So going through each one of the categories, for housing programs, our, home, our homeowner rehab and reconstruction will set aside 35 million. Rental housing rehabilitation, 13 million. Rental assistance, which is temporary assistance for relocation of people whose homes are maybe uh, need major uh, renovation and they don't have the resources to move out temporarily is what that, that category is for. And then new affordable housing construction, 60 million, 596,000. 
for a total of $108,746,160. So under affordable housing construction, this will not just be our traditional affordable housing um, that we use our leverage with our trust funds and some of our federal funds, but we will also be emphasizing the vulnerable population that we mentioned early in the presentation. We are going to be targeting funds for um, housing projects that will, will be serving people coming out of homelessness and like permanent supportive housing, um, special needs housing for people who are, um, are disabled or handicapped and need, um, and, and need a more affordable um, place to live that has services. So we are looking forward to um, doing a lot of different type of housing projects with this funds and targeting some of those vulnerable populations. Infrastructure and public facilities programs, we will have, these are the categories for those. Um, we can have flood and drainage related repairs and improvement projects, stormwater management projects, water and sewer projects, rehabilitation of public facilities, and we can also construct public facilities such as, uh, you know, a homeless shelter as well can fit in this category. Mitigation is a set-aside requirement, and it must be part of our rebuilding efforts through our CDBGDR um, eligible activities. So it, it will, the mitigation will enhance and incre increase our resiliency to, to homes, such as new roofs, hurricane straps, um, we can use it for increasing uh, infrastructure capacity, uh, such as stormwater capacity in flood-prone areas. And we can use the money also to strengthen our uh, long-term res resilience of our own public facilities that serve low to moderate income populations. Um, economic revitalization, as mentioned before, was not deemed to have a, uh, a large unmet need. And there was already a lot of programs that were, um, that have already been administered and that have been funded to assist small businesses in, in during the recovery. So we had CARES Act funds, American Rescue funds, and even our, um, some of the programs that the county initiated, um, their Small Business Boost Program. And we still have programs in, in, that are established like our um, business assistance through Neighborhood Quarters Bank Program. So at this time, there are no funds budgeted for um, economic revitalization. In public services, um, these are the categories that we are um, recommending for funding. Um, Self-sufficiency services will cover things like financial literacy, housing search, counseling, legal assistance uh, for $2 million, health services, mental health services, $2.5 million, job training, job placement services, $2 million, and other economic recovery-related services, 500000 for a total of $7 million. These funds will be, will be allocated over the period of the grant, so there will be over a, four, a five- to six-year period. It's not like we will, we will show up this, this money within one or two years. The administration um, activities necessary to ensure the grant um, management and implementation and compliance requirements uh, for the CDBGDR grant, is re, it's a six-year grant to spend the money. Um, we have the 5% allocation for $10.9 million. There is a small allocation for planning and studies. These are costs to conduct mitigation and resiliency studies to address future hazards and storms. Um, and this uh, allocation is $5 million. Uh, program overview and project selection. Um, the homeowner rehab and reconstruction program will be implemented countywide, including the municipalities. It will be administered by Orange County through our division with support from, from key vendors and consultants. Applicants will apply directly through our CDBGDR website when the program opens. Uh, rental housing rehabilitation and new housing construction Recipients will be selected through a competitive process. The program will be open to private, nonprofit organizations as well as public housing authorities. Infrastructure and public facilities, recipients selected again through a competitive process. It will be open to municipalities, nonprofit organizations, county departments, and divisions. 
and public service uh, activities. Again, recipients will be selected through a competitive process open to nonprofit organizations. Mitigation pro pro projects to in increase resiliency to future natural disasters. Recipients will also be selected through a competitive process. Again, open to municipalities, nonprofits, and county departments and divisions. Mitigation measures are also to be included as part of all of our housing and infrastructure projects. So we are looking for um, mitigation features to be, to be included in all of our projects, um, and we will be able to enhance some of those with additional funding under the mitigation set aside. So our next steps and action requested. Um, January 11th, um, the public comment period closes for the CDBGDR action plan. And so those public comments can be received to us via our website. Um, January 18th um, is our deadline to submit this plan um, to HUD uh, for their review. Uh, it has to be submitted along with our implementation plan. We expect HUD to, they have a maximum of 60 days to review the plan. Our hope is that within 45 days we get comments or we get a glowing review that, hey, your plan is approved and send us our grant agreements. We will be working on expanding operations um, really over the next um, month in terms of staff capacity. And we are, work, we are currently working on an RFP for consulting services to help us uh, implement um, some of this uh, large uh, grant. And again, we have six years uh, from our funding agreement with HUD uh, to uh, spend those dollars. The action requested today is the approval of the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Action Plan and approval and execution of certifications, application for federal assistance F SF-424, and assurances, construction programs for community development block grant disaster recovery, and delegation of limited authority for the county administrator to execute the CDBGDR grant agreements with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And that concludes our presentation this morning. And again, there has been a lot of uh, effort and work put into this endeavor. Um, I want to thank uh, the wonderful team that we have in uh, our division, Housing Community Development, and also thank all the commissioners that attended our community meetings and assisted us in um, getting the word out uh, to the community to provide input. Thank you. All right. Um, great job, Mitchell. Uh, it is evening time. <laughs> it feels like uh, morning to some people somewhere in the world, I guess. But um, when you talked about the next steps and, and actions requested, uh, one of the things that kind of stands out is this deadline to submit the CDBGR action plan. Um, how uh, definite is that, that deadline? What happens if we don't make that deadline so we had we had asked for an, an extension there's only a, a, a one-time extension you can ha, ha, you can ask for for the grant which was originally due in September and so we got that extra 120 days so it is due um, on this date and uh, and if you don't submit it by this time you could be putting the grant in jeopardy all right so that's not negotiable so we'll be submitting it, and um, the specifics associated with the projects. Uh, that is uh, kind of explain kind of the timeline that we have to kind of come up with the projects and how that process will work. So we are in control of you know when we get started um obviously we can't spend any money until you know hud executes grant agreements so over the next two you know two two months two to three months we expect working back and forth with hud to get this plan approved get our agreements signed in the meantime we are going to be building our infrastructure in terms of our staff capacity we're going to be putting out an rfp for our consultants 
And then we also are going to, at the same time, work on our implementation plan. How are we going to put out some of these um, RFPs for municipalities and our own county divisions to respond to? How are we going to make operational our housing rehab program? That we're going to need a vendor to help us build the kind of capacity we're going to need to run a countywide rehab program. But we are going to start working on those steps um, really um, tomorrow, basically, after this plan is approved. Staff is working on getting it into a, a, an electronic system to submit to HUD. That's what we'll be doing over the next week. Um, and then we hope that in three to four months, um, we can start issuing some RFPs for people to respond to uh, those um, in terms of projects for infrastructure, municipalities. Um, we still have to write some policies and procedures and application processes. So all that's going to take on. So, so there, is a, there is a three to four month period of time to gear up. And then we should be able to start putting some stuff out. And are there communities around the country, local governments, that's ahead of us in the process? So um, I think that, like, the four counties, Lee County and Sarasota County, they didn't ask for extension. So they, they put their stuff together very quickly. Um, and they're still working on their implementation process, but they're starting to get some stuff out on the street. Um, uh, Volusia is about where we are in terms of uh, implementing their plan as well. So um, some did not put together, uh, ask for an extension, um, and they, they still had a lot of work to do after, uh, back and forth with HUD. Um, but they, you know, they went, they went a different route. We, and they also did not do as much outreach that we did with our community. They also, their plans, when you read their plans, it's hard to see, you know, where they're going um, with it. And I think we have, uh, we have, we tell a story of what was our impact, what of our needs, and where do we need to go. And so, um, uh, you know, can't, statewide, I mean, the state is set up to do these grants. They get them every few years. They have offices, disaster offices set up. This is the first time that Orange County is receiving this fund. So there is a learning curve, and we want to do it correctly. So um, we took, we took um, diligence in, in putting together what we think is right for us. And, I mean, what about around the, the nation? Are there other communities? Because so, what, I'm, what I'm after here is, uh, is an opportunity for us to learn a best practice, uh, something that someone else is, is doing. Oh, yes. That is yes. Absolutely. No, we're, for yeah. us. no we, are, we are looking at what others are doing. We are talking to um, uh, uh, staff at other um, states that have run these programs, and we are uh, obviously, we're, we're, we're we're looking at their request for, for consultant services as well to get ideas how to develop our own RFP for that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. I, just, I want to start out by saying thank you so much to you and your team for, I know there was a lot of quick movement and a lot of moving parts, but to be able to come out to our communities and to very distinct locales that, you know, haven't had this opportunity to discuss these types of things that they didn't realize had fallen through the cracks, right? We're talking about things that were not able to be repaired by their home insurance or FEMA or whoever else. And so the time that went into that, and I know it was very intensive, and I just want to thank you all so much for that. Um, I also have been engaged with a several NGOs about the process, and I want to make sure I get this totally straight so I can continue to dialogue with them. This is now, once this goes through, the approval's done, they can continue to look for those RFP opportunities as they come. Um, I know that we have some nonprofits that are interested in particularly the, the climate impacts and resiliency, and I want to make sure they stay engaged with us. Yes, they will definitely be able to. And, and the RFP process will, will, will probably be a multi-year process. Yeah, I, 
think we'll be issuing RFPs for a while. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. Mitchell, I, I want to echo you and your team have been great, and thank you for listening to us, you know, as you went on these endeavors. But I, I think one particular point that I wanted to bring up is you're trying to maximize funds to be used here in Orange County, which means I'm sure other counties or municipalities just kind of gave out the contract and let them handle it all. And I wanted to note that you've particularly been very engaged with your team to make sure we get as many of those dollars to get into the hands of the residents and the different programs that are going on. And I think there has to be some recognition for you guys doing that because that's, that's pretty important. You know, we could have had a chunk taken off the top. You handed it over to somebody to run the whole thing, but not. You're making sure that we're getting very um, in the weeds in the sense of getting all of these details, and I think that's fantastic. Something that I said to your team, there seems to be a message that's starting to take on by itself and I think it's going to be so critical in March when we come back is that we really define what and whom and what projects will qualify for this. And I think that's going to be key because I think there's, like I've mentioned, I've gotten folks saying, when can I apply to get some funds? You know, like there's this deadline. And I think one of the things the county did very good during CARES and during COVID is we set these guidelines. Like this is what the county is offering assistance with. And I think that's going to be, communication is just key. Communication is key in all of it, but thank you for trying to maximize dollars into the hands of the people into Orange County by taking this a step further. Not everyone did that. You know, there are municipalities and counties that just said, hey, you know, organization blah, we're going to let you run it all and just take care of it, but you went out of your way and caused a lot more work for yourself and your team to make sure that we maximize this as opposed to just handing it over. So commending to you and your team for being so diligent and, and making sure we get this excited to see what we can offer and, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully help folks, you know, get back. So thank you. Mr. Conkle. Yes, Mayor. We have three speaker cards. All right. So, so I wanted to make sure that... Um, so I, we have, uh, we'll start with our public comment. Um, and uh, as you all come forward, each one of you will have three minutes to speak. That time will go quickly. Uh, so uh, with that, um, you can call the first All right. speaker. First speaker is Sarah L. Badry, followed by Allison Crawl, and followed by Martha R. You'll have three minutes. Thank you, Joe. Hey, May uh, hello, Mayor and County Commissioners. I have the privilege and pleasure of, to serve as the Deputy District Director for Congress in Maxwell, Alejandro Frost. Congressman Frost represents Florida's 10th Congressional District, uh, which includes portions of unincorporated Orange County within your districts, as well as four municipalities, the City of Orlando, City of Winter Park, City of Maitland, and the Town of Eatonville. Today, I'm here to give comment on Orange County's action plan regarding $219 million from HUD's Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, the CDBGDR funds are the result of Hurricane Ian, a FEMA declared disaster. Because of HUD's designation of the county as a most impacted and distressed area, we're thankful for HUD's decision to provide these funds directly to Orange County. We believe these, this allows for a more streamlined process to assist directly impacted communities. As a longtime participating jurisdiction of HUD, we trust Orange County to administer these funds, and we want to applaud the county for conducting a comprehensive unmet needs assessment, doing unprecedented levels of community engagement and outreach, and collaborating with local stakeholders and county residents to produce this action plan. I'd especially like to highlight the impressive county community outreach done by the Housing and Community Development Division, which, as you know, uh, immediately followed their involvement with countywide community engagement for Vision 2050. Our office was able to attend six of the 13 public meetings and also share the part citizen participation survey with our constituents via newsletter and social media. The county also received input from dozens of nonprofit organizations, and most of the municipalities in our district were also able to attend the September 13th meeting for local jurisdictions. I'm here today for three reasons, again, to acknowledge the county for producing a plan using robust data and working diligently to design the plan using community input. Two, to support the request for resources, staff, technology, and otherwise to efficiently administer and monitor the significant amount of funds and the resulting programs and projects. 
The CDBG DR program is clearly no small matter, $219 million within a six year window. It is critical to provide the organization and structure to support this program. And three, we'd like to make a note about the jurisdictions within Orange County having equitable access to these disaster recovery funds. Um, as a recipient of these funds, Orange County has a full county to consider. We understand that there needs to be an RFP process for municipalities because of their status as sub-recipients, but it's important to note that like the storm did not discriminate by jurisdictional boundaries, the relief and assistance should not either. While some jurisdictions may have greater capacity than others, we want to stress that the smaller jurisdictions with less capacity have vulnerable populations as well um, and should be considered for this um, uh, funds. Um, uh, they should receive the support and technical assistance to access um, the program. We have copies of the projects uh, shared with the county from our municipalities. I'd like to highlight a few of those projects. City of Winter Park has, um, would like to make improvements to Killar Lake Killarney to mitigate flooding around Lake Killarney, which affects Winter Park and unincorporated uh, Orange County residents. The town of Eatonville has a list of projects, including items such as a flood control study and wastewater inflow and infiltration. Uh, improvements and the city of Orlando if you don't mind very quickly also has a project list which I like to highlight does a really great job of addressing one of our community's greatest needs housing by seeking to create new affordable housing and preserving the existing housing we do have it is a tremendous unmet need because unlike other places in the country that may see a population decrease we actually see an increase um, following the disaster. We cannot take our eyes off of housing. With that said, thank you so much for your additional time. And for the record, Sarah Albadri, 617 North Magnolia Avenue, Orlando, Florida, 32801. Thank you. All right, thank you. You rushed through it, and if there's something you want to get us uh, in writing based on what you said, we, we would appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, please express our appreciation to the Congressman for uh, supporting us in these efforts. All right, with that, we'll move to the next speaker. Good evening, um, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, this this CDBG D, uh, DR plan. Ma'am, could you give us your name and address for the record? Please? I'm sorry. Name and address for the record. Name and address: Allison Crawl, representing the Coalition for the Homeless of Central Florida, 18 North Terry Avenue, 32801. So I think that um, the CDBGDR plan provides an opportunity, just an incredible opportunity for Orange County residents and the surrounding communities. I fully support the efforts this funding will afford. Um, we are just so honored as an agency to be able to serve 700 of our homeless guests on a nightly basis, serving moms and dads with kids and single men and women assisted over 2,100 people in, in um, getting into permanent housing last year. Recognizing the woeful shortage of housing availability for those in the lowest income in our community, combined with increase in rent and just the cost of everything that exists out there right now, um, it's, it's a tough time for people in our communities. This funding will allow for shoring up the infrastructure and increasing capacity of facilities that provide shelter during crisis weather events. Um, these could include many natural disasters, hurricanes certainly. These shelters provide for the most vulnerable in our community from those who may be at risk of their housing being flooded um, or high winds, those who have physical disabilities to those who are homeless. This is an opportunity to ensure that those who need shelter from a storm can find a safe, secure environment, ensuring the safety of our neighbors is of paramount importance, especially during emergency weather events. With a shortage of homeless shelter beds throughout the Central Florida community, um, this will offer the opportunity for an increase in capacity for those with special needs, um, including very, very vulnerable populations such as those folks who are experiencing homelessness and are still on the streets. It will assist them every single day in addition to what we'll be able to ensure for our, um, weather events. Permanent supportive housing meets a critical need in the, in the community for our most vulnerable folks who are living on the streets, providing long-term rental assistance to those who have been homeless for a long time and also having a disabling condition and are at risk of dying on the streets of Orange County. We have an opportunity to further build out this infrastructure with this funding. We have a chance to impact the housing inventory for special needs populations, including elderly men and women, 
those who may suffer with debilitating um, uh, disabilities, those with medical and mental health um, issues, and we, and of course, those who are experiencing homelessness. So just want to take this time to thank you for giving me the opportunity to support the projects that will positively impact the housing status of those most at risk in our community. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Grohl. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening, mayors and commissioners. I am evening. aware I am now between you and dinner, and so I will try and hurry. Um, first, I want to acknowledge with appreciation the hard work that went into this plan, um, significant research and community engagement. Uh, so kudos to Mitchell and your team. Um, I have, uh, I can say honestly that I read the entire thing without falling asleep, and that's fairly uncommon for me to read one that long without falling asleep. So, um, as you know, the people who are most vulnerable during any disaster, whether it's hurricanes or heat, are our unhoused neighbors. And the most effective way to mitigate their vulnerability is to ensure that our community has an adequate stock of affordable housing throughout the entire county and actually the whole region. We ask that the county prioritize housing investment for people facing the greatest cost burden and those with the greatest risk of ongoing or future homelessness, including those who are at or below 50% of median income. Additionally, the households that are at less than 30% of area median income have significant challenges avoiding homelessness or moving back into stable housing after a homeless episode. It's worth noting that the communities, neighborhoods that have a preponderance of that income group also tend to overlap with the communities that have a preponderance of mobile homes, um, including neighborhoods in the northeastern and northwestern part of the county. And those are far more vulnerable during natural disasters. Further, those neighborhoods have no permanent homeless shelter options nearby despite their increased vulnerability of homelessness. While seeking permanent housing options, people experiencing unsheltered homelessness and those who would become homeless as a result of a storm are desperate for congregate and non-congregate shelter opportunities year-round, and they need shelter or housing that can accommodate their partners, their possessions, and their pets. Low barrier, 24-hour shelter capacity across the county would immediately reduce disaster influence risks both before and after our community is hit with another hurricane or flooding. We are grateful for the county support of the existing homeless shelters that are concentrated in a small geographic area, but we also ask that the county maximize the use of these funds to create new geographically diverse shelter opportunities that will meet the needs of all of its citizens experiencing homelessness. And my name is Martha R., and I'm with the Homeless Services Network and the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness at 142 East Jackson Street. Thank All right. You. Uh, thank you, Ms. R. Is that just R, or is it A-R-E? No. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> All right. Next speaker, please. Pat Sell, the speakers we have, Mayor. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all, those of you who uh, came to speak. Uh, we are going to close the public hearing at this time, and uh, I'm going to make a motion for approval uh, of the requested action. Second, Wilson. We have a second by Commissioner Wilson. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, thank you, Mitchell. Uh, we look forward to um, regular updates on where we are within the process and so we're excited about the potential uh, for our community to hopefully close the gap uh, that exists with homelessness within our community uh, so uh, if there's no further action uh, today i think that we will stand adjourned